Hmm. This new transceiver is still giving me issues. They said the bitrate would be better. They said it would have better cooling. But no, no, it has to start failing the day as I install it. Uh, let's see here. Nodes 1 through 11 appear to have a stable bitrate. The transceivers on those ends don't have any problems, unlike this garbage. Hmm, let's see here. Other parameters are within the green. Well, let's do it then. We are ready for transmission. Greetings, wingmates. I hope that you are doing well in whatever temporal situation you may find yourself in. Ah, it is good to be here. Ah, I see that we already have had some input into the console. Shady Desu, Project Derp, Ringo, Amiwa, Herculine, Headless, all of you, welcome to the convoy. It is good to have you flying, even before I jumped into the system. <laughs> How are you all doing? How are you all doing? Ah, Corpse, welcome to the convoy. Or corpse greater. <laughs> uh. Oh, you're ready for some battle mech action. Uh, greetings, uh, Ray. Good to see you with the convoy, too. Oh, I see that we have some doing great. Excellent. I myself am uh, doing uh, splendidly myself. I had a nice little walk in a simulated neighborhood today under the sun or the old soul, as it was simulated. I do have an affinity for that particular uh, spectral color. I have been to systems where there is a blue sun, and unfortunately, that doesn't really... That is not something I enjoy nearly as much as the, uh, the sun under which our species evolved under. I, I suppose that may be a... Uh, uh, I have no good reason for it, but I do prefer a yellower tint to my light. I recare. Welcome to the convoy. Ah. <laughs> ah, well, I wouldn't call this a virtual reality. I would call this a... Mm, well, I call it a simulation, but it really is much more of a... a um, it does not seem, if you are not familiar with it, to be any more distinct from reality, as the neurons in my mind where my optical inputs would normally have been coming in from my very own eyes, or from the uh, neurons within my skin. They have all been, I suppose, intercepted, and so the sensations coming in are not buffered by anything. Well, there, there is, of course, a buffer within the simulation uh, in order to protect me from false and uh, extraneous and egregious inputs. But overall, it is as if you exist, so... Perhaps maybe with this context, wingmates, you would understand why I spend so much time in a simulation. Because as far as I'm aware, uh, besides the uh, interface, it is a reality. <laughs> well, blue light does disturb your sleep. <laughs> well, luckily I was not sleeping uh, much on that world that I was visiting. It was, uh, or at least sleeping above ground. Uh, it was a vacuum world that I was on, so it was... Uh, all of the blue light was filtered through a helmet, one way or another. Or at least the visor of a helmet. Uh, greetings, uh, TK. Welcome to the convoy. So, now that we, uh, we, have, we are here, today we'll be doing some Mega Mech, which is, of course, the Battletech tabletop game as done by the community. And here, let me uh, Mega Mech, I think. Oh, no, no, I've misspelled it. Mega Mech. There we go. So there is a link to the game itself and to the Battletech universe as a whole. And I really should put a Sarna link into that because Sarna, the Wikipedia or the equivalent of a wiki for the game, is incredibly useful. Apologies, my simulation is having some uh, hiccups here. Perhaps literally, one could say. <laughs> ah, let's see here. Ooh, Herculean, I'm sorry to hear. 19 hours of checking any kind of log and answering questions is difficult. I'm glad that you're here to relax with us, although perhaps our uh, a little game here might not be as uh, as simple as we expect. 
Do you have simulation that works like a game, like Devil May Cry or Doom? Ooh -hoo. Well, uh, Project Derp, the, there are many ways that you can run a neural simulation. The end point is that it feels as if it were real, or I suppose as real as you can simulate it, the, uh, um, the sensations. Uh, I do prefer more realistic ones. They help my sanity, but occasionally I have engaged in, I suppose, more visceral and more unrealistic simulations, such as those where one engages in a power fantasy, as if they were in a first-person shooter. <laughs> Why would he not? A oh, woe. <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh my, oh my. Well, now that we've, uh, now that we've explained what we'll be doing today, which is Mega Mech, why don't we, why don't we actually move on uh, to the simulation room, wingmates? Here we go. Ah, uh, there we go. Come on, come on. Fantastic. So I'll be switching between game capture and window capture, as this is a little bit, there's a lot of things that go wrong with this particular game. Do you have clean water in the future? Ah, uh, Rick Air, uh, there is, depends on the uh, situation you're in. But I suppose the bare minimum of life support for any colony, vessel, or I suppose uh, functional civilization is to have a source of clean water and clean water purification, or water purification, so that if you take uh, non-potable water, such as that within the um, excretions of human beings, both atmospheric and uh, otherwise, you will need to reprocess them for reuse. Of course, there are plenty of sources of, I suppose, mm, actual water as a substance itself. However, there may be chemical contaminants in there, such as heavy metals, that will need to be processed out, even if you are, say, for example, on a planet covered in ice or a moon with uh, significant moisture within the atmosphere. Uh, but yes, uh, unless it is a terraformed world, you will not survive for long without water. Unless, of course, you have been extracted from your mortal shell and placed into some kind of cybernetic body. And then you will have a much easier time surviving, as your water needs are generally met within the metabolic control systems of your housing. Ah, Ringo, you are cur curious about a quirk of Megamech. Has anyone attempted a build where they not merely implemented jump jets? but set up the thruster so that the mech is pushed forwards instead of merely upwards in an arc. Uh, so Ringo, the closest thing I have to that particular understanding would be mechanical jump boosters. It is a very oddball piece of experimental equipment, and that forces you to only travel in a straight line whenever you use jump movement. Uh, the primary advantage is you can use them underwater, along with, I believe, there were some other things that made it uh, a little bit different. But mechanical jump boosters are, I think, the closest thing to that. Otherwise, jump movement in general is very flexible and allows you to move anywhere within a circular radius of your mech. Oh my goodness, Urkeline. Um You should probably consider some kind of rest, and I absolutely will have zero judgment. In fact, I will praise you if you go to bed. But uh, if you fall asleep to this, I will be fantastic. <laughs> Go to the front line faster! <laughs> Forward jump chits and a melee weapon, like a pile driver, would be, would be extra impact mass. So, jump attacks are a special rule in Battletech, and I'm not sure how mechanical jump boosters interact with them, but I think you can actually do a death from above or one of the other derivative attacks using those particular rules. <laughs> Nah, not possible. Need to work. Too many stupid questions. I'm, I'm sorry, that is the situation. <laughs> and then, not implying anything here, putting anti-mech pods for those explosive claymore fun. Yes, I, I think that could be a very interesting unit, but it would be definitely be very difficult to use due to the nature of uh, mechanical jump boosters. Not to mention mechanical jump boosters take up a significant amount of weight. Urban mechs. Urban mechs from everyone. Everyone. We may actually have some urban mechs today, TK, because now moving on to Mega Mech, we are going to be doing a demonstration of what I believe is at most possible, I suppose within reason, with Mega Mech. And this means using many of the optional rules, 
playing with not just mechs, but tanks, infantry, and potentially some aircraft, and also playing with double blind rules. And what double blind rules are is, in essence, the, um, the ability, or essentially, you will only see enemy units that are visible to one of your units instead of having a bird's eye view of the field. And yes, we will likely have elementals or battle armor. So. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I'm glad you're enjoying this uh, particular game, Rekair. Yes, uh, Fog of War. Fog of War, Bunzel. Welcome to the convoy, Bunzel. Oh, I see you're having some uh, mint and green tea ice cream. That is that is a nice, uh, a nice flavor. I once had it synthesized for me. Although, I suppose tea plantations are not the priority of terraforming worlds. Although, now that I think about it, I did once ship about 20 tons of what they called Ceylon black tea. And that was a rush delivery, oddly enough, for some sort of festival that I, I did not quite understand. But uh, I was paid handsomely for those 20 tons. So, no complaints from me. Alright, so, if we're going to be doing an urban map... We should have an urban setup. Let's see. So let me first add our guest of honor tonight, Princess. And let's make sure that Princess has no forced withdrawal this time. We are going to fight to the death with Princess. And that is okay. Let's see here. She has no strategic targets, which means we could actually set up certain locations to which she would approach. But we may do that later. Uh, let's see. Save changes to this configuration. All right. So now Princess will not retreat. Well, it is a luxury item for a reason. I suppose, I suppose, I have had a tea in the past, but I suppose uh, the, typical, uh, <laughs> the typical nutrition system of any spacecraft is not really set up for that sort of ingestion. It would have to be pre-brewed pre and containerized before it would be compatible with the system. And I simply was not willing to engage in that, considering that Having extra weight for what is uh, essentially containers full of boiled water with flavoring agent was not something I was willing to do to cut into my profit margin. Re reaction mass is not cheap at times. Alright. I suppose it is more metaphysically precious than it is uh, expensive in terms of credits. There is a right way and a wrong way. There is a right way, a wrong way, and the Steiner way which is the wrong way with Assault Mechs. Yes, TK, that is the exact attitude of uh, the Lyran Commonwealth, which is a Germanic-themed faction led by House Steiner. Right, so, why don't we start adding combat units? Rikair's favorite part of Battletech is logistics. What is yours? Uh, wingmates, what is your favorite part of Battletech if you enjoy it? I personally enjoy worship combat quite a bit, but that is a personal quirk. Although I, I do think I enjoy the level of detail involved and the construction of mechs very much too. So, now that we have two players, Spacer Haywire and Princess, let's, let's think about what kind of force we would want. So I think we will limit ourselves to approximately a company-on-company -company engagement, although we will try to keep it, um, I suppose... What would, what would a good word for this be? Let's keep it... Let's keep it diverse. So, why don't we start off with mechs? I want at least one heavy, one, one assault, one heavy, one medium, and one light. Just so we could have a demonstration like this. I see that logistics and politics are also a, a fun part of the Battletech universe. And yes, if, uh, if you read into the fiction and even into the rules, of a system of, say, for example, Inner Sphere at War, I believe, is the strategic system of Battletech. You will find rules for that. If you think there's something you wish to simulate in Battletech, there will generally be a rule. Now the question is, is anyone else willing to play it with you? That is the biggest problem with Battletech. Who will play with you? I like the battle to battle bit gameplay that MechWarrior 3 did. Forgot what those mobile field bases were called. Ah, uh, they were mobile field bases, headless, if I recall correctly. And welcome to the convoy. <laughs> I don't know much about mechs, but I will learn on these streams. Well, I'm glad, Projector. So uh, this one won't be a tutorial, and I will be doing a battle tech tutorial where I'll explain the fundamental mechanics all the way from the base and moving up. 
but that will come later. So for now, let's throw together a, mm, shall we do Inner Sphere versus Clan or shall we do Inner Sphere versus Inner Sphere? Hmm. I think we could do Dark Ages and have perhaps maybe one or two uh, Clan mechs that are amongst Inner Sphere mechs. Okay, so this is going to be an urban scenario. So I would like to actually use something I haven't used in a long time. The Annihilator, which is a 100 ton mech with a very powerful arsenal. So let's see, we have the Clan Annihilator with the Ultra 8 Auto Cannons. We have the Annihilator A4H. Let's see here. Hmm. Mechs are like Gundams, right? Well, mechs are bipedal war machines, or in some cases quadrupedal, or, or uh, tripedal. And, and there are, of course, some other special layouts. But they're essentially the... The mech is a 12 meter or so tall war machine powered by a fusion reactor held upright with a gyroscope and a neural interaction using a, an object called the neuro helmet with the pilot and equipped with a significant amount of firepower, be it ballistic, missile, or energy. And of course, it is significantly different from Gundam in that most of these craft are not very fast, or most of these mechs are not very fast, and they generally do not, um, they do not use handheld weaponry. Most weapons are built in. But yes, as uh, TK said, some of the older designs do actually come from the, uh, some various anime from the past, and that was in fact a big legal, legal battle. And yes, the Annihilator's name is fantastic. So this one has heavy PPCs, I don't want that. I think I want the Annihilator 3... No, 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 this is not the variant I want. Let's see, do I have everything selected? Yes, I do. So this has the LBX-10s and medium pulses. And it's a 2-3 with... Uh, the Annihilator is great, but it has significant armor problems. So I don't know if I actually will want to run an Annihilator. In this case, a King Crab might actually be the, the mech to run. And I might run a King Crab. And the King Crab is a twin heavy autocannon wielding mech. How much ammo do we have here? So the King Crab 005 is equipped with two LBX 20s, uh, two Streak SRM 4X, and an ER large. How many heat sinks though? We have 24 total heat dissipation, so that should be acceptable. I think we can run the. I think we can run the King Crab actually. Let's see. Was the one you recommended to me an Omni Mech? But I'm terrible with names. I think it was based off the of Thor. Uh, it might have been the Sunder if it was based off the of Thor, and we can actually look at the Sunder. In fact, I may take the Sunder because I do I do like it as a mech. So this King Crab has twin LBX twenties, which are hole punchers, and I think in an urban environment that will be excellent. This is a Word of Blake design, I believe, because it has an improved C3I computer which is a command, control, and communications system which allows for a very interesting in-game mechanic. Ah, yes, Sunder indeed. And yes, Tex Talks Battle Tex. Uh, TK, if you would like, please feel free to link Tex's YouTube channel on in the chat. That would be greatly appreciated. Let's see here. So, the... Let's check, let's check out how much ammo we have. We actually have six tons of autocannon ammo, which is excellent. Normally, one of the big issues with the King Crab is that it is very, has very short ammo. So if you look at the King Crab 1, actually the King Crab triple zero, it has two autocannon 20s, but only 10 rounds for both of them, which is a significant problem. You only have five shots per gun, and generally speaking, you will miss with over half of them. So, there we go. The Urban Mech? Omni Mech. <laughs> yes, that, that in one way. You could, you could put it in that way, I suppose. Oh, thank you. Thank you for putting uh, the Black Pants Legion YouTube channel up, TK. So, why don't we take the King Crab 005. And it has good armor. It has a standard fusion engine. So this is what we call a zombie because it would be harder to kill. Let's see, there's the TR, uh, yes, it has the TRO page. And it has a long range weapon too. 
So let's select the King Crab. Now let's think about a heavy mech that we would like to run with us. And unfortunately, this Sunder is an assault. So, I'm not going to take the Hammer Hands because the Hammer Hands is... Oh, this is a newer variant of the Hammer Hands. That has Rotary Auto Cannon 5s. Where's the old Hammer Hands? Hmm. Did they remove it? Oh no, it's a primitive mech. So it may not be available here. So, I'm looking for mechs that are within the 60 to 75 ton range. And I think I may actually take a Thor. Let's take a look here. Because a Thor has jump jets in many of its uh, configurations. In fact, I think in all of them. I think jump jets are fixed. Let me double check. Uh, let's see here. I don't remember if jump jets are fixed. Let's see here. So, the Thor, on its primary configuration, which is Thor Prime, is a 585 moving mech with a... Now, and 585 means that it can walk five hexes, run five hexes, which means it has a harder time hitting anything uh, due to shaking while running, and it can also jump five hexes. So this one has an LBX-10, uh, an ERPPC, and an LRM-15. And the nice thing about clan weaponry is that none of these will be... None of these will actually have a minimum range. That is one advantage of most clan weaponry, except for Gauss rifles. And minimum range means that if you're close, too close to an enemy, you will actually have a harder time to hit them. So, I actually... Mm, I don't know how I feel about this. There's very little ammo for the autocannon. There's much more LRM ammo, which I do not like. I would rather have more autocannon ammo. But that is only that is only my thinking. So let's not go with that. We might go with the Avatar. And the Avatar is a heavy Omni mech, which means it can reconfigure its weapons loadout before battle. And I actually do like the Avatar. Let's see if there's a jumper. So here's a 4464 Avatar with an autocannon 20. So this is another very urban uh, variant of it. This is actually a very decent loadout for the Avatar. This is a range support Avatar. Hmm, I want something a little faster, because even in urban situations, rapid movement is helpful. So let's see here. Battle Axe, Lumberjack, Archer. The Archer is a classic long-range support mech, so I will not be taking it here. Although there may be a variant with SRMs, if I recall. Or maybe not. Oh, there's a variant with MMLs, and MMLs can use short-range missiles. Whereas typically, the Archer is relegated to only long-range fire. Warhammer is not a bad mech, although it has minimum range issues. We could run a Catapult with SRMs, and I think we may take that as our heavy. Let's see, where is the Catapult? What is wrong? Oh, we're sorting by weight, and I think the, the Catapult of this fame is a little heavier. Sometimes variants actually become heavier, or, or lighter, depending on the, on the way the lore works. So this catapult, I may actually take a close-in catapult with SRM-4s, although I, don't, I do not think that it is a, a mass-produced variant. So let's see here. We have the Catapult 2K2, or K2, which is a Draconis variant, which has energy weapons instead of the missile racks that the catapult has typically. And the catapult, as, it, as its name implies, is a long-range variant, long-range mech. So I think we'll, we would have to look at the Butterbee variant, which is a personalized Solaris mech, if I recall correctly. And this one has short-range missile racks. But I think, I think it's not the most appropriate, perhaps. So let's take a look at some of these other heavies. We have a Cauldronborn, which is a clan heavy. Uh, let's see if any of these have jump jets. Although the Cauldronborn is fast enough that it could actually do without that. So let's see here. Why don't we take a look at what we have. Medium Pulse, ERPPC. Uh, I think a Cauldron Born might not be the worst thing to take. We have the Jaeger mech. Why not? We, we will take the Cauldron Born. This is a sniper, but we will utilize it in a different way. Let's take a loadout that is actually useful in an urban environment. This one is running Ultra Auto Cannon 10s and has quite a bit of Ultra Auto Cannon ammo, which is good. Then we have a hag wielding one, and a hag is a hyper assault Gauss rifle, which is a rapid fire, essentially, Gauss shotgun. So, 
The H variant has an Ultra 20 on it, along with heavy mediums and a bunch of other heavy lasers, but it is poorly sunk. You know, I think we'll take this particular variant of the Cauldron Born. So let's select the Cauldron Born H with its heavy lasers. And what a heavy laser is, is it's akin to a normal laser, but it does double the damage, although for the penalty of a it being harder to hit. But luckily, this variant of the Cauldron Born has a targeted computer, which will compensate for the difficulty in shooting. So let's see here. We have a kink... So we unfortunately have very close in mechs, and I don't think that's perhaps... Uh, it's too specialized, I think, actually. So we may not go with the Cauldron Born after all. We're, we're power gaming here, and I don't want to do that. Power gaming is not necessarily fun. Let's go by the chassis name, I think. Let's see here. What's a nice heavy that we can roll with? Oh, what's the gallo glass look like? <laughs> a 464 brawler. Okay, you know what? I have not used the gallo glass in a while, and it's in the heavy range. Let's see. What variants do we have with the gallo glass? Gallo glass 1. Pretty, pretty solid. Let's see here. Gallo glass 2. Mm, not very inspiring loadout. The, the Gallo Glass 3 is very powerful, with a Gauss Rifle and a number of ER lasers. Now the 4 mm, also keeps the Jump Jets. And then we have these variants. I do not know what the LA stands for for this particular variant. Ah, hello Tamaro, welcome to the convoy. I hope that you are doing quite well. Alright, so... I think I will take the, Gal the Gallo Glass uh, 2. It's a bit of a weaker mech, and I think it will be more than acceptable to run something that isn't power gaming. So we'll replace the Cauldron Born with that. Now let's take a look at something a bit lighter. So let's go back to weight sorting. Let's sort by weight and then secondary sort by chassis. Although I do not think it wants to behave right now. It does not want to behave right now. All right, so let's take a look. Let's go into the roughly 50 tonner range. Uh, ooh, we can run a Bushwhacker. And a Bushwhacker is a very classic medium mech. Mm -hmm -hmm. Oh, this one has a plasma rifle and some MML ammo. Let's see. Armor is decent. Speed is pretty good. Ah, uh, greetings, Edinburgh. Welcome. Ah, uh, today we're actually not doing a design. We are playing a bit of Mega Mech. We're not going to be using the, uh, the VTuber mechs, but I think it will be... It'll be interesting to, to have a game with some of the advanced rules features. Just so we can show off what Mega Mech exactly can do. So let's run a Bushwhacker. And we'll also run a Light Mech for scouting. And the Fireball is not a bad one. Although it's a little bit light. I think I will run the Assassin actually. Let's see, the Assassin, I believe, is a 30-tonner? I'll have to find it. Although, because we are in an urban environment, something with a sensor system might actually be of benefit. So, let me see if I can find a, a Jenner with a sensor system. And a Jenner is simply a... a mm, right, Jenners are not scout mechs. Jenners are typically fast attack mechs. They, they're, they're skirmishers. Hmm. But yes, uh, if uh, if design was more of what you're interested in, I, I, I do not think I'll be doing any in this stream. But uh, if you'd like to stick around, please do. We will hopefully be engaged with the battle shortly. Let's see, so the Assassin is a scout mech, but I would like to make sure I get one with a sensor system. And I don't think any of them have it. Uh, that would likely be more of a... A Strider might have it, but a Strider is a dismal, a dismal, dismal mech. A Strider is essentially a, a joke of an Omni-Mech, one of the earliest to be made. Mm, okay, so we are moving a little heavier. Oh, Raven. Let's see, where do we have the Raven? So, Raven. Raven is an absolute classic of a sensor's mech. So, let's take a look. So, we have... What's a middling Raven here? Raven 4LR. I think this might be Liao variant. So, this one has three ER mediums, an ML7 and a TAG laser on it along with Artemis Fire Control for the MMLs. And we also have 
Is this an illegal design? There's only one Artemis fire control system. There should be two. Or maybe there is no, uh, no counter for it. Oh, you haven't watched the game of Battletech before. Oh, interesting. Well, this should be, uh, this should be educational. But it does have an active probe, which we will need for double blind. In essence, double blind means that if a building or something akin to that blocks your line of sight, you will have to, uh, you'll have to put up with it. And you won't be able to see the enemy unless you have sensors that are actively seeking them out. So, uh, do I want to, do I care about NARC? No, uh, NARC is, NARC is not a very good system. So these are the more combat-oriented ravens. These are, in fact, the experimental ravens. I think the LC or the LR might be what I want to do. What, the LR is a Jihad variant, and it is standard after some time. Does the TRO have anything? Um, okay, it's not even aware of where it was introduced. But this has an active probe, which is what I care about. It has an ECM suite. And it has a very decent weapons loadout for a scout mech. So I will select the Raven. So let's get rid of the Cauldron Born. And right now I, I have this much battle value, around 6,815. And battle value is simply a points balancing system for Battletech. You use it to make sure that enemy forces are appropriately within a challenge, I suppose, uh, an appropriate challenge, although it is not a perfect system by any means. So, let's add some mechs for Princess. Last time I played Princess, she was using an Atlas, and I failed against the Atlas. So why don't we bring back the Beast and have a, have a showdown of heavy assaults, and we'll throw on the Atlas... And make sure that this is assigned to Princess. So the Atlas is essentially a very powerful uh, assault mech that is known for its infamy as a close combat fighter. Let's see here. And I will have to give a slightly better variant than the usual mess that an Atlas is. So that might be the K variant, actually. Hmm, let's see here. We have a large laser, a Gauss rifle. Hmm. Or the standard variant actually is not bad, even later on. Let's see, so we have the Atlas AS7, AS7D, which is the classic Atlas variant, with an autocannon 20, and some rear-facing weaponry. We have the RS. I need one with an autocannon 20. That is my main goal. Uh, let's see here. So the DC has a command console in it. From the Draconis Combine. We have the C, which is a sniper variant. What was the S like? The S does keep the AC-20. But it does also add rear-facing streak SRM-2s. Who designed this? Who designed this? This is awful. The Thedcom was often not performed in the field by newer Kareem Atlases. Of course it was. This is terrible. No, 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 I am not assigning that. Oh, a heavy Gauss rifle. That might be terrifying. All right, we'll, we'll give the heavy Gauss rifle a spin. So the heavy Gauss rifle is a fantastic uh, weapon because it does a enormous amount of damage. And uh, it also makes sure... It is one of the few weapons in Battletech where if the mech fires it, it must make sure it keeps standing. Is it a good idea to play Deep Space 1 at midnight? I do believe I will get a nightmare. Uh, Derp, I don't know if that's a good idea, but if you wish to get a nightmare, uh, then that is the right thing to do. I don't know if you're looking for some sort of uh, sleepless night or maybe some lucid dreaming, but uh, that might be interesting. <laughs> All right, so let's assign Princess the Heavy Goss wielding Atlas. And what other weapons does it have? It has two ER larges, which is decent. And it has an LRM-15. No, you know what? I'm handicapping uh, Princess if I do that. I'll give her the classic. I'll give her the classic Atlas. There we go. Or we have a DR. With a heavy PPC. No, no, no. I want the classic AC-20 equipped one. Mm, okay, no, we'll have to go with that. So we've gotten her the Atlas AS-7S2. We will give her a heavy mech. And let's see here. Uh, greetings, stay-at-home ghost. Welcome to the convoy. How are you? I am... I'm doing quite well. We are currently getting ready to play some Mega Mech. We're giving Princess so many atlases. Well, you see, I failed against her earliest atlas. So I am going to give her... Oh, oops, I gave her a second one. 
So now I need to give I need to give Princess a heavy mech. And I think we will use. We will give her a Thunderbolt, which is a classic mech, although I'm giving her all of the good mechs. This is a bit of a this is a bit of a foolish move on my part. Thunderbolt. However, I may give myself an Air Force. Let's see here. Mm hmm Okay, so. The Thunderbolt is another classic Battletech mech, so let's see. 9S. 9S. 9S! No. The Thunderbolt 2B. <laughs> uh, Nier Automata. What a, what a fantastic game and a fantastic soundtrack. Oh, Wingmates! I've forgotten. I wanted to have some, uh, some music playing, and that will be once again the Mech Warrior Two soundtrack. I do enjoy it so very much. All right. I hope that uh, volume is appropriate. There we go. Ah, Ghost, you like the soundtrack, but you found Automata missed a mark for you. Ah, interesting, interesting. Uh, what is it? What is this? Uh, that. Missed the mark, in your opinion. Uh, because uh, some have given reasons for not enjoying Nier Automata, but I, I find that the reasons are very myriad. It's quite interesting. Ah, greetings, Bone Miser. Welcome to the convoy. It felt very Philosophy 101. A lot of very basic questions. Very little actual insight. Ah, I see, I see. I suppose, yeah, if you think about it that way, then perhaps there may not be as much as one would hope in there. Hmm. At the same time, I suppose, did it have to be there? That is not sort of a judgment on uh, on the game itself. I'm sort sort of wondering if video games are the easiest way to deliver philosophy in, in, in any sense. I suppose Spec Ops The Line, while it did have a powerful message upon time of release, Sort of the, the meaning behind it has probably faded into parody at this point. Music is a bit quiet. Okay, let's uh, turn it up a little bit. There we go. A lot quiet. Well, I'm also trying to keep it uh, from being, uh, you know, intrusive. <laughs> In my opinion, when... R you know that Nier... That the first Nier is being remade. Sadly, it's the big bro version. You prefer the dad version. I see, Project Derp. Yes, I had heard of that, that it is being remade, and it's quite an anticipated release. In my opinion, when writing a story, you should either attempt to answer a question, or at least explore it in some sense. Ah, I feel so fly to just ask the question without going anywhere with it. Hmm. Oh, good, good. I'm glad that the music is at the proper level. Oh, ten days till near. Ah, let's see here. What's this? Is this jamming up? Nope, it's playing correctly. I just forgot that the track is a little funny. Uh, I suppose, yes. Um, hmm. Did Nier answer the question it set out to ask? And I suppose, what was the question that it asked? Is the question perhaps that, is there a difference between Android Machine and what is humanity? I suppose it also depends on what question you thought was being framed by the game. I suppose, to me... The answer was never given explicitly, but implicitly there was enough that you could perhaps contextualize what was what was being insinuated. You thought that the question was very vague. What does it mean to feel be human? Well, I would argue that is a question, and maybe maybe hmm. There are everyone has different tastes, so perhaps it is perhaps some. Perhaps some enjoy a more detailed question, and perhaps some games are better off with a more in-depth question. But at the same time, at least from my personal view, that sometimes very general questions are also an acceptable format. And it really does depend. And at least for me, Nier had enough other things going for it that sort of the unspecificity of it all was more than acceptable. But that, that, that is only my view, and I very much understand the criticism that could be levied upon that. Now, this is getting a little bit loud, and a little loud on my end, too, so I'll have to turn that down. There we go. Hmm, let's see here. 
Da, 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 da. Ah, there was actually a lot of reflections on humankind and how it repeats the same mistakes, no matter how smart it deems itself to be. Well, it's not a bad question exactly, but all I'm saying is that if 1999's Robin Williams, classic, bicentennial man, does a better job. And Miwa says, I am basing my answer on a huge amount of philosophy theory references. Ah, so, Ghost, you believe that it did miss the mark. Hmm. Do you, do you hold a movie, which I suppose has the, the, I suppose, storytelling advantage of a viewer or a participant in it being completely directed? Um, do you, do you hold that? I suppose it's not, I'm asking you if you do hold it, but I personally will hold it to a lower standard of, I suppose, control over the question, because I think one part of games, especially at least in the case of one with so many endings and so many possibilities as near, or just any game with different story storyline possibilities, I suppose, can you truly deliver as strong of a message if you do not dire as directly control the actions of the participant in the story? If the viewpoint cannot be nearly as focused, and especially when there is also considerations of Mm, I suppose visceral entertainment and also a significant duration where you may not necessarily be able to fine-tune every aspect of the experience. I think they can be comparable. It's not like the writing in Nier is extremely system dependent. The dialogue is pre-written in the end, even if it branches. Hmm. But I would in some sense argue that the branches are what make it significantly more complicated. If you only know one way of how something will work, you can focus your entire being of, as a story writer into putting it on. But if you need to consider multiple possibilities, while with a game, of course, there are options in terms of writing out a story um, and how much time you can put into each branch, I think there are still other limitations that play into it. But I do, I do agree with you that you can make something incredibly powerful. But I guess I'm, I'm just saying more, more from a general philosophy of game design versus other media. For example, a novel would have different considerations, I think, in terms of meaning and the ability to ask questions. Not that a game can't go as deep as a novel, but a novel is a long-form thing that also engages a different part of the human consciousness and perhaps human different parts of the human psyche. And I don't disagree with you either, uh, Ghost. I, I think this is very fascinating, uh, the way that the story works. Miwa said, I think this depends a lot on taste. And also, this is only if you assume that what he proposed uh, was the question that the story was trying to make us ponder. Yes, indeed, Miwa. I think that uh, <laughs> there, we, all have a, we ha all have our own ways of uh, looking at something. And especially, for example, take me right now. I am trying to uh, also engage in some battle tech while also trying to think of these things. So my current thinking is not the same as I, if I was in perhaps text-based direct messages with someone else discussing this. Headless, you judge games by what aspirations it tries to have. Reason why Fable games best get bashed a lot is because of a, of the hype before they came out. Decent games otherwise. Indeed, that is what I heard, Headless. I have had little experience with Fable, but from what, from what I understand that uh, it sort of fell shy of what they were reaching for. And yes, Miwe, I also think there is not just one me. <laughs> Ah, you sent a, a read-along that messed you up. Ah, what was that story, Ghost? Yes, yes, Ringo. Human consciousness can learn the wrong lesson indeed. And as Battletech showed, that is very much what can happen in, uh, in all of human history. The inner sphere is doomed to repeat the lessons of its past again and again. Human greed and uh, insanity continue to circle around the drain of impending doom. Although luckily humanity is big enough and atomic weapons are taboo enough in Battletech that that does not necessarily happen. The dialogue was written from perspective of a character that talks very little and tries not to tell its opinion a lot to be. So we kind of get to observe many people with different ways of imagining the same reality. Anes, an Anemone, and A2. Yes, that, that is a good point, Miwa. That, um... It is a multi-perspective story, but also one where the narrators are very flawed. Can't have battle battles in Battletech uh, universe if if it's if the Battletech universe was very peaceful. Indeed. So this is why we have Eternal War. Oh, Melkior does look a little bit like uh, Melkior's mech does look a little bit like a Thunderbolt. 
uh, that launcher on the side, although it does have a bit of blood asp to it. So, let's see here, which Thunderbolt will we run? Now that we're back to uh, Battletech. I think we can run one that has more of a close range setup here. Let's see here. Da -da 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 -da. The 9M has a light goss. That's a Merrick variant, I think. Anything with a light goss rifle is probably a Merrick variant. Ooh, Stunt Mine by Braulio Tavez. Oh, I was not able to watch that particular part of Arippi's uh, read along. But I may have to check out the VOD now. And, but I will also put that if it, within my data console. Thank you for that uh, title. The story messed you up. Oh, goodness. And I will have to check it out indeed. All right, so. 10E. There are a lot of Thunderbolt vari variants here, as you can see. Ooh, the Thunder Stallion. But that is an Assault Mech. Ooh, now that we're here, we can actually go with, look at the Thunder. Hmm. The Thunder is a Liao Mech which has some very interesting properties to it. It's a triple strength mimer equipped mech, which means it gets stronger in melee as it gets hotter. Let's see. <laughs> Project Derp is having a bit of a moment in dead space right now. Ah, uh, yes, yes, the, the head does look a little bit like the Thunderbolt's um, vision slit. On oh, Melchior's mech. Okay, let's see here. Ooh, so many Thunderbolts, so little time. Let's go with the one with the snub nose. Perfect. The 11 SE. All right, and let's let's throw down a medium mech. So let's go with a Centurion, actually. Centurion. Oh no, there are more Centurions, and there's the Omni Mech Centurion. Well, let's just go with the most basic Centurion variant. The uh, let's see, D3. Yeah, the D3 is a is a perfect example of a Centurion, which is a very basic trooper mech. Let's see here. You Stay at home ghost, your battle tech with experience is pretty limited, so forgive the basic question. But what is the biggest mech portable gun? Liao, the reason the way the galaxy can't have nice things. Uh, so the biggest weapon would probably be, as Attenborough stated, a long tom cannon, because if I recall you cannot fit the Unless you're running a super heavy mech, you cannot fit the long tom artillery piece onto a battle mech. So you must, in essence, run only the shortened cannon. But, uh, I think 20 tons is essentially the biggest weapon that is mounted on most mechs. I don't exactly remember the, the total weight of the sniper cannon. Uh, yes, there was the Ares, there was also the Poseidon, and the Orca. And I think... What was the stone rhino based off of? Was it based off of... It was not based off of the orca. The orca was an experimental 200 tonner. But the Ares and, Ares and the Poseidon are cousins. Uh, the Ares is an Omnimech version of that. Of a three-legged tripod super heavy battle mech of 135 tons. So, let's go to... Oh, so now we need to light mech for... For our dear friend here, for Princess. So, let's see what we will give her. I think we can give her a Fire Falcon. No, no, no. Let's give her a Commando. A Commando is a classic speedy scout er, a mech for urban operations. And I think that it will be a decent... Let's see, the Commando 7B with Flamers. Oh, you know what? The Fire Starter might be a, a decent mech to give Princess. Fire starter. Oh my goodness, I forgot how many variants of the fire starter there, were, there also were. It's both an omni mech of a medium size and a light mech, but it's a standard battle mech in this case. Yes, the the heavy goss is also a very heavy mech. Uh, the the super heavies are bigger, but generally most mechs weigh anywhere from at the lowest end, I believe, 15 tons to 100 tons. But on average, I would say the typical mech is anywhere from 60, uh, 60 and up tons. Simply because light mechs do explode fairly quickly. Although that does depend on the era of play that you're in, and it does also depend on the, I suppose, the area of combat and who is fighting. So let's see here. Let's see, which fire starter are we going to give? Probably one of the ones with higher battle value. Uh, there we go. I think that is an acceptable fire starter to give Princess. 
And let's remove the Atlas K3, which we will not be using. But yes, mechs are fairly large, but uh, there are, of course, craft that are larger in the game. So, now that we have a, a force of mechs, why don't we actually also add some vehicles? Not too many, but we'll go to tanks. So, <laughs> this, this, there's a lot of choice in terms of tanks and other vehicles. As you can see, Battletech is strange enough that you can actually have a train as a vehicle. And this is a passenger train right here. That is simulated. So on the battlefield, you could have a train or even a 240 ton wing and ground effect support vehicle with a significant amount of Thunderbolt 10 missiles. Let's see here. So I think I would like, not a Huey, let's have some, uh, ooh, Zukov or Von Luckner. No, you know what? I'll take the... Let's see. Von Luckner is a bit... Mm -hmm. Yeah, Von Luckner is too urban. I will take the Patton. Let's see. So we have the Patton Ultra. Okay. So the Patton is a heavy tank, which essentially uh, can you... is, I suppose, one of the yardsticks by which you can measure armored vehicles in Battletech. So in this case, it has an Ultra AC-10, so I will take a pair of patents. Alright, excellent, excellent. I think I grabbed the Battletech strategy game, the video game one, I mean, in the last Steam sale. Might have to check it out soon, the universe seems pretty interesting. Ah, yes, yes. Oh, uh, allow me to throw up the Mega Mech. Uh, here we go, Mega Mech. This is where Mega Mech lives, and also there is a link to the Battletech Primer site, which will have an entry point for books, as in fiction, if you like reading. It has the rule books for the tabletop, and it even has a role-playing game. But yes, the universe is very interesting, and I heard very good things about the Battletech strategy computer game. Um, I, I have not actually played it myself because I had Mega Mech, but I would like to try it someday, as it is a little bit different than Mega Mech itself. All right, let's take a look here. So let me, let me link Sarna before I forget. So Sarna is the wiki for Battletech, and it's very good for, uh, for finding out lore about the universe. Ah, you're into role-playing games more than tabletop. So what I will say is the Battletech role-playing system is not the biggest draw of it. It is a little bit clunky, it has some incredible level of detail that is not for everyone, and in general it's not being supported right now. If you're looking for splat books, Battletech role-playing is uh, somewhat... It's somewhat mm, anemic in that regard. You, Although Battletech itself is almost like a role-playing game, as you may witness as we begin playing this game. Let's see, do I want more vehicles? I think I... I not yet. Let me look at some of the other tanks. I think I will give Princess uh, a tank set of her own. And I will give her... Mm-hmm... <laughs> So right now she has a lot more BV than I do. So I think I will give her, I will give her much lighter tanks. I will give her some some scorpions, which are very pathetic and weak little tanks. In fact, I will give her the medium laser variant of the scorpion. There we go. So now she has two scorp oh, scorpions I sent to myself. I will change owner to Oh no, that I, I actually sent the patents to her, so I will change the owner to Spacer Haywire. There we go. That makes it a lot better. And now I have more BV, so I shouldn't have given her the scorpions. So let me delete the scorpions and give her some proper tanks. Uh, or what I could do is actually give her more units. I'll give her two scorpions. In fact, I'll give her a lance of scorpions. Why not? And then I'll give her some SRM carriers. So SRM carrier. We'll pretend that um, that she is actually defending. So let's see. I'll give her SRM carrier. There we go. Give her two of those. And that about matches the battle value. So right now we are somewhat evenly matched. Although unlikely to, to be that way. Ah, yes, yes. Uh, th thank you, TK, for once again bringing up, uh, bringing up <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Black Pants Legion. Do you ever play tabletop Warhammer Spacer? I have played a tiny amount of Epic 
using figurines that I made. And of course, I roped in one of my spacer friends to, uh, to do that while we were at a station. And, uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to do much of it. But I did get a chance to play more Battlefleet Gothic, uh, the original tabletop game, and, of course, the video game itself. But I definitely enjoyed Battlefleet Gothic. All right, so let's add some VTOLs so that we have aircraft. Let's see here. We'll add a pair of VTOLs to each faction. So I think I will take the Warrior Attack Helicopter, which is a fairly decent piece of equipment. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll add a pair of, of Warriors because they are pretty, pretty terrible craft. Hmm, no, 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 no. Apologies, wingmates, I had a bit of a hiccup there. Uh, da, da, da. Let's actually have aircraft that are not total garbage. Okay, so. Kestrel, Sprint. The Sprint is not bad. Okay, you know what? I will, I will throw down a pair of Sprints for myself. And I will give Princess something else for about 400 or 500 battle value. Let's see, what's an equivalent? Uh, I'll give her I'll give her the warrior or I'll give her one of the warriors here let's see here da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Kestrel I'll give her the Kestrel there we go so princess can have a pair of Kestrels it's about 200 BB uh, da, da, da. Ah, have I gotten to look at Traveler at all? I have read some of the rules for earlier editions, but I've never had an opportunity to play Traveler, although it has been suggested multiple times. Um, I, I definitely would like to take a look at it again at some point, but of course, time is often very limited. Really cool sci-fi role-playing system. Feels a bit Firefly in the typical playthrough, but it's a very flexible system. Ah, yes, yes, uh, that, that's what I've heard about it. It is very, very capable and having a different way of portraying its uh, those scenarios. Battlefield Gothic indeed, Headless. Battlefield Gothic indeed. I very much like the, the way the tabletop plays. I think it is one of the best put together tabletop worship systems if you do not care about uh, hard science fiction. Okay, so I think I will also add, for demonstration's sake, some aircraft. So aerospace fighters, I will add a pair of... Mm-hmm. Maybe a pair of Hellcats, or maybe Visgoths. Let's see here. No, Gotha. I will, I'm going to add some Gothas. The 500 is a success that I've had. So, Gotha 500B. There we go. So, I, I will take a pair of Gothas, and I will give Princess something else. The Gotha was about 1,500 BB. Let me sort by battle value for fighters. So I'm looking at around 1,500 battle value in terms of fighter craft. So, oh, the oh the Chippewa, uh, the Chippewa, the Chippewa is more than acceptable. I think uh, I will give that to Princess. There we go. So Princess now has the Chippewa as her fighters. I I do not know if she can actually use them very well. I have not actually uh, listened to Renegade HPG. Do you enjoy it, TK? I've been wanting to run Traveler for years, honestly. Also, there's a long, detailed, but interesting YouTube series I can link to you for background listening after stream if you want for getting an overview of Traveler. Uh, sure, stay at home, Ghost. That would be interesting. Feel free to link it or uh, DM me uh, if you'd like on Twitter, if you would like to uh, make sure that I get it, as sometimes I am very bad about links that pass by in chat, even though I do try to save them within my browser system. All right, so I think we are pretty much ready for combat, but what I will do, wingmates, to demonstrate the power of Battletech is I will load my craft onto a dropship. So let me see here. Let's see what kind of dropship has the correct number of pods. So I think I will use a Union. Let's see, so I have I have a total of four mechs. No, I need to make sure I can also run vehicles. Can the Confederate run vehicles? No, it can only run mechs. Uh, let's see, Trojan, Blockade Runner, Buccaneer. No, the Buccaneer's a um, borderline a bomber. No, no, it's not a bomber. It's it's a very interesting bit of a dropship. 
Oh, I see. Interesting, TK. Uh, feel free to uh, uh, paste that in or DM me if you would like, or if you would like others to see it too. Yeah, feel free to do both. Feel free to paste in chat or DM me uh, so that others can see it too. Because I would be interesting to, to talk with some of the, uh, to hear a talk with some of the authors of, this, of Battletech. Let's see, Polaris. I need something with a vehicle. I have forgotten completely which dropships have both vehicles and mechs. I think I may have to go to an Overlord. Let's see, so we have Battle Mech Bay, Battle Armor Bay. Da, 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 da. Dragao. No, we, we're not going to run the Dragao. Pentagon, maybe? Maybe the Pentagon. Let's see, cargo space. The Pentagon's more of a uh, more of a combat dropship. The carrier. Overlord C. No, that one that has no mechs. That is a purely, purely Union X. So Union X might be okay. Or the vehicles could start on the ground too, but I'd rather have everything go with us. So we have the fortress. Ah, okay, so the fortress will work for us. There we go. But it only has foot platoons, and I wanted some battle armor. But I think that is acceptable. We'll start with the battle armor on the ground. So let's go with a fortress dropship for us, actually. There we go, and we will move this. Change owner to Spacer Haywire. There we go. Da -da 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 -da. Oh, thank you, thank you, TK. Let me click on that and save it for later. There we go. Oh, thank you. I will subscribe to this channel immediately. There we are. Maybe I'm too much of a space marine now because I'm uh, dabbing on these monsters. You just might be Project Derp. Uh, that is uh, that is what happens when you develop a reflex for shooting at Xenos. Oh, that'd be interesting to hear about someone who works on Sarna. Because I, I very much uh, appreciate Sarna's presence. Now, does the uh, does the fortress actually have capacity for? No, I don't think it does. All right, so why don't we add some some battle armor? Let's go to battle armor, and we'll we'll go with some inner sphere standard maybe. Mm, actually, no. Let's uh, let, let's go for some serious battle armor actually. The Ravager, Ironhold, Tengu, Elemental 2, Hauberk. Which one is the Hauberk? I want a Light Goss. Yes, I think the Hauberk... Hauberk... No, no, that's a very slow piece of armor. Needs something a little bit faster. I think we will go with the... Maybe the Cobalt. The Cobalt's not a bad... Okay, Cobalt is actually pretty bad. Tornado... No, no, no. Kage, Intruder, Gladiator, Nighthawk, Airy. Ooh, a talk with Stackpole. <laughs> oh, Stackpole is notorious as an author for having battle mechs explode more than they canonically would, but uh, many have enjoyed Stackpole's uh, particular style of writing. Hello, Cabal. Welcome to the convoy. Good to see you here. I'm getting ready to launch my battle, uh, but it is taking a bit of time for me to prepare the the exact forces that I will be having. I think I would like to use Grey Death, maybe? I need something with a mag shot. A Grenadier with a mag shot. What's the move on it? 2-2, two, two, and it has missile racks. Yeah, I think I'll go with a with um with maybe four Grenadier battle armors for Princess. And I myself will take Something with us. I'll take elementals. You know what? They are battle capture. Let's run some elementals. Elemental with the ER laser, I think. Yes, yes. I will take the elemental and they will go to space or haywire. I'll go with two squads of elementals. There we go. And the battle value should roughly match. If I have three squads of grenadiers and I have two of elementals. There we go. Stackful explosions were mini nuke mushroom clouds instead. Indeed, they were. It is a little bit too much. Reactors essentially just fizzle out with some hot gas coming out of the breach. However, we do have the stack pull rule enabled in that we can actually overload our reactors. <laughs> so we may, if, if one of our mechs goes down, we have enabled the self-destruct rule, actually. But yes, it, uh, uh, let's see. In case of not knowing how much they explode, or is it the Michael Bay explosions are cool, so why not approach... Uh, generally, the explosions, if they're not ammunition explosions, are very contained. 
And even so, ammunition explosions will generally, on newer mechs, be contained by the way the mech is constructed. Okay, so, we have our forces arrayed right now. So now let's pick a map. Let's make sure that we have a good urban map. Let's see here. Hopefully one with a landing zone for our dropship, because I would like to demonstrate what it's like to land in Battle Battletech. Ah, uh, yes, I have heard of Lancer. I do follow uh, Kill Six, Six Billion Demons as a webcomic, and I greatly enjoy it. So I have heard of, of the uh, creator's uh, battle or uh, mech, mecha system, although I've never played Lancer. I've simply had too little time to enjoy Lancer, unfortunately. So let's see here. Let's take a look where we can get some urban maps. Mm-hmm. <laughs> River plus coast, siege, siege bottom left. I think there was an urban port. Industry, industry, Flughaven. There's a lot of German maps in this game. Maps that were created for the German language edition of Battletech. As you play as a group for an Evangelion, a Battletech mech, and a Gundam all rolled together and fit in the same world. That's pretty sweet. And plus photon scale stuff. Ah, interesting. I always find it difficult for there to be an idea of balance when you have things that are of such different power levels and calibers. But then again, I am also, when it comes to role-playing games, I don't really believe that balance is necessarily always required. I, I enjoy it when, when things are off-kilter. So, why don't we... Why don't we add some City Hills residential maps here? So we have some rolling hills. I need a spaceport map. Seaport. Hmm, seaport might work. Although it probably has far too many structures. Let's see here. Military base. Ah, drop port. This is what we wanted. So we will be landing at a drop port. In addition to us. Shit, let's take a look at this one. Let's see here. View game board. Mm hmm. Oh, our dropship can most certainly land here. That should be acceptable. But that one has... One second, please, wingmates. How does that drop port look? Uh, let's take a look. View game board. Okay, you know, that is, I think, an acceptable introduction to an urban zone. We'll go with that. We'll go with that. Drop... Mm, or drop port one might be better. Let's see here. Ah, it's too open. But... I don't think we're going to get much better than this. So, why don't we... Maybe Seaport. Let's check how that looks. Nope, Seaport won't fit at all. We'll do we'll do Dropport. We'll do Dropport. It's not a big deal if we have a little bit of a... bit of urban terrain there. There we go. So, we're going to have... at least a 4x4... Four four, a 2x2 two two map. And the rest of it will be urban. So, we'll make this corner the drop port. Let's see what the game board looks like now. Oh my goodness, that is having a problem. Yes, that will be fine. And the rest of these maps will be urban. Perfect, perfect. Let's see here. They did a little fluffing on it. Oh, I see, I see. You like some broken things in RPGs? I do too, Headless. I do too. That is, the mechs inspired by one property are roughly equal uh, to another property in power. AKA the Star Trek Star Wars, the Trek Wars crossover. Oh, I see, I see. So as long as it's within roughly the same power scale, it should fit. Okay, that I definitely understand a little bit more. Hmm, let's see here. So let's run a city skyscraper map, I think. Here we go. And that we should not crush or crash. So see drop port was here so why don't we do that view game board that is not the right suburbs that i wanted no 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 move that into position view the game board no that is not urban enough i don't think but it does fit rather well so hmm okay here's what we'll do we'll do an assault into a city and then city downtown we'll do it for this map and City Skyscraper, we will do for this map. The game board. Okay, that should be busy enough. I think that will be a very nice and busy map. 
Uh, Battletech has this wonderful map preview feature, which has been invaluable to, uh, to, uh, to I suppose, creating these things. All right, there we go. We have our urban setup. So let's make sure we select the rules correctly. So we go to file, game. We go to, get, not client settings. We go to game options. So game options. So let's take a look at what options we want for this. Da, 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 da. Okay. More like if there are different power scales, just make them the same power scale in a new thing because it's more interesting. Ah, I see, I see. Ah, apologies, apologies. Uh, yeah, th I find that very difficult. So in a sense, I don't even try making things that I believe come from different power scales to be, uh, I suppose, compatible. But uh, that is a personal uh, quirk of myself. Uh, these game boards are fairly easy to make. You, there is a map editor within this Battletech system. And they are rather detailed, I will say, in many cases. All right, so... We're going to make sure that we have double double blind is the rule system we're playing with. Let's see. We are not going to use deployment zones. Da -da 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 -da. Smoke. Direct fire. Smoke drift. Hmm. Random basements. Uh, yes, we're going to use random basements. So, so every building in Battletech has a chance of having a basement if you do it this way. And a basement can mean that your mech simply falls through. Although I don't like it because it means it's very risky to enter a building as a battle mech. Which it should be, but it makes it even riskier than usual. But let's let's keep this game very difficult and use random basements. So victory conditions, allowed units and equipment, all correct. Let's see here, advanced rules. Okay, we're going to use double blind and sensor rules and no double blind messages. So we will not know what is going on unless we see it and we will hide battle value reports. So this battle should be very scary. If you know how the spreadsheet mech labs work, yes. Ah, uh, yes, yes, as long as you know how to fiddle with it, you, you should be able to make maps. How is it done in tabletop version with the random basements? Roll a die when they move into space? Ah, uh, yes, yes. There are tables for everything in Battletech. And you will basically, um, depending on the agreement between players, you will have to use a given rule. And as you can see, I'm currently going through a bunch of checkboxes, and that's all of the rules that we're picking. Uh, so we're probably going to use Tac Ops Beagle Active Probes, which will allow for better targeting. Let's see, Battle Armor Weights, no. We're going to use... Da -da -da -da, fatigue, Tumbles, Quirks. Oh, let's see, the Quirks might bite me in the, in the posterior very quickly, but hopefully we'll be all right. Okay, advanced combat. Let's see, engine explosions, no. No called shots. No advanced criticals, floating crits. Yes, that is good. No line of sight. Uh, I, since we're fighting in an urban area, I think we will do Tac Ops partial cover. And partial cover is essentially if a half of the mech is not visible, it is harder to hit. And anything that would have hit a location behind cover uh, will not actually do damage and will hit the terrain. So let's see, where is Tac Ops Partial Cover? Do I have it enabled? That might be an advanced ground movement. Let's see, Gauss Weapons, Woods Cover, Vehicle Effectiveness, Firing Arcs, mm, Kinder Rapid Fire Auto Cannons. No. Mm. Oh, there we go. Tac Ops Partial Cover. So it allows very special ways of partial cover. And it also allows for you to be covered halfway vertically. Normally, Battletech only allows you to have partial cover that covers your legs, since you're behind a hill or something like that. But in this case, if you are peeking behind a building, you'll be able to use partial cover that way. But it's a very special rule. So direct blow, glancing blows, diagramming line of sight. I think that's okay. Grand movement rules, tacked off sprinting, skill evading. Defensive PSR. Mm -hmm. Most of this is acceptable to me. But as you can see, this game is crazy enough that you can enable an option for zip lines so that infantry can unload from a helicopter using ropes. That is how much detail they put into this. 
Let's see here. Vehicle turn mode? No, we do not want to make vehicles any worse than they are. Most of these uh, options here already make the difficult rules for vehicles even more difficult to play with. Okay, let's see here. Skilled leaping. So we have leaping avail uh, uh, available. Jumping into heavy woods. I apologize that I'm muttering a bit, but there are so many rules. I would be here all day. I will most likely do a tutorial for Battletech where I will go into all of the details here. So. Let's see here. So I'm going to use some rules for aerospace. Okay, initiative rules. RPG related. Okay. Let's save those rules. Oh, let's, let's be okay with those rules. Alright, so let's make sure we pick at least one of our mechs to have a better pilot. So what we can do is we can configure the pilot to be a 3-4 a three, four, instead of a 4-5. And when I say those two numbers, I mean that the gunnery and piloting of the, of the pilot uh, are better. And in Battletech, the way it works is since, because, since you must roll on a 2d6, which is to say two six-sided dice, above, at or above a certain number, from 2 to 12, um, essentially you will have a pilot skill of say 4, and when you do a check such as shooting, or trying not to fall, you will have to roll that 4 or above. And if you have a lower skill such as 3, you will have to roll a 3 or above, which is much more likely. So this is why that is better. So let's make sure that uh, our friend here, Princess, also has a 3-4 pilot. Let's see here, so three and four. There we go. And our battle value is not going to be equal because we have a dropship on our side. Speaking of dropship, let's load the dropship. Although, do we have an Omnimech? No, we do not have enough Omnimechs. So what I will do is I will actually add to myself uh, some very cheap vehicles that will allow me to transport battle armor. So let's see here, so APC. Uh, let's see here. I will have a basic heavy hover APC with six tons of troops, three tons of troops. I think I would like a heavier AP. Mm. And I'll take two smaller APCs over one heavier one. And I need four tons, or five tons at least. So this is an early clans. I want an inner sphere APC. Mm hmm. <laughs> I think I want a very basic APC. This one's too light. Oh, and no, I do need a 5-tonner. Okay, so I'll have to take the Anat. There we go. So I'll take two Anats. So now that I have an armored personnel carrier, I can... I can load my elementals into it. Oh, no, 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 I had a foot base, so I, I don't actually need APCs. That's totally fine. So, let's see here. Load into the fortress. The Gotha will... Let's see here. I can't load it into the fortress because there's no slots for aerospace fighters. But otherwise we will load all of our assets into the fortress dropship. So we're putting our mechs and our vehicles into the fortress. And, and a dropship is in essence a enormous uh, craft. A cargo craft, typically armed, capable of also flying from ground to orbit. Generally speaking, un unless it is specifically an orbital only dropship, which is never designed to enter a planetary atmosphere. All right. So we've moved all of our assets into the fortress, and we need to make sure that the fortress deploys correctly. So let's configure it, and we will make sure that the piloting is zero. So one of the issues with uh, Battletech is that there, every time every time aircraft are hit, there is a high chance that they will plummet anywhere from one to six levels, determined rapidly on a six-sided die. And that unfortunately is an enormous problem because it means that your expensive assets may end up crashing just because someone plinked them. So we're going to simply avoid that entire problem that would normally be done via house rules by simply having the dropship deploy uh, deploy at altitude 4, uh, or have piloting 0. And that way, we should have no issues with this. 
There we go. And the Gothas will be will also have similar things. So we'll configure them to have a much better pilot so that maybe they won't crash. So piloting two is very good, is pretty good for aircraft. And we'll have them all start at velocity one. There we go. And we'll do the same thing to this other Gotha. So we'll customize it. We'll configure it to have a starting velocity of one and we will have the pilot be a two. There we go. And let's make sure we're fair to our friend here, Princess. She's also going to get a 4-2 pilot for her craft. And her deployment can be whatever. It doesn't matter that much. It does not matter that much at all. Okay, there we go. So. We need to make sure that she deploys in the north of the city. So let's make sure we add or change start. We'll change the start to be north for her. And our start will be any, but we will play fair and attempt to play this as if it were a scenario. So what we are doing is our dropship and its escorts are, is, is landing in an opening in a, in a city. And we are going to de de defeat the defenders of this particular, uh, this particular location. So that is essentially what we are planning as a scenario right now. So let's make sure we save our unit list before we before we lose any further. In case something goes wrong, we will at least be able to load it. Okay, here we go. So we are ready, I think. Let's see. Battle value might be balanced. The map is okay. Planetary conditions, we'll keep them standard for now. We'll have no wind and no strange lighting. Okay, so I think we are good to go. Let's begin the combat. Oh, I can't choose any in double blind. Hmm. That is one very silly thing. All right, so let's change our start to be the south east. So I'm done. Okay, there we go. Okay, so now we must deploy our forces. Let's make sure we deploy our dropship first. Oh, so one of the issues is that the way this is playing right now, it will not work quite well. So allow me, wingmates, to actually transfer to window capture mode. One second, please. Let's see here. Let's turn that off, and we go to the Mega Mac lobby. There we go, there we go. Yes, this is a very good song, Bone Miser. A very good song indeed. Alright, and we will we clip it. Yes, we did. We, we clipped the, um, the controls, unfortunately. But that is to prevent some problems with this particular game. Ooh, thank you for those mercenary unit links. That is much appreciated. There we go. There we go. Excellent. All right, a Starwind's Whippets. That is a very fascinating unit name. Okay, so we have now switched to window mode. As you can see, we can see our little mini map and our mech table. Let's see, so my zoom is behaving funny. Let's see here. Okay, what is going on with the scroll? Did my settings get changed? No, so control is this way. And otherwise, this is zoom and shift will... Uh, one second, please, wingmates. Uh, let me check my client settings here. So what is going on, going on with the key binding? So scroll, toggle isometric. Let's see here, general tab, hex display, button order, graphics. It might be in main. Okay, so smooth scrolling. Da -da 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 -da. Flip mouse wheel zoom direction. Mouse wheel zooms map. Let's disable that temporarily. I want to... Okay, there we go. So... So shift, mouse wheel will move us on the x-axis, and mouse wheel moves us on the y-axis, and control mouse wheel now moves us uh, zooming in and out. There we go. So our objective will be essentially to take on Princess, who's going to be hidden within the city. And we will attempt to land somewhere here. So let's make sure that we have our dropship fairly close, and we will deploy it. 
And there is what the dropship... Oh. It's going to be hard to zoom here, unfortunately. But there under the cursor is the mouse, is the dropship. And I must actually deploy my fighters simultaneously. So I will deploy my fighters here. And actually, I will place them on top of one another. So we will probably have to do air-to-air -air attacks and simultaneously also attack the enemy. So the enemy has deployed, and as you can see, we can see the Chippewa fighters, which have a line of sight on us. So, let's make sure we select our dropship. Um, and this is the artillery turn, and technically this dropship can use artillery attacks, but for fairness sake, I will not actually use the weapons on the dropship in this scenario. So, we're going to skip this phase by hitting done. There we go. And now, Princess is making some moves. Although, she may take a little while, as we are using hidden movement rules. Okay, let's see here. Okay. Alright, so now we must move. And what I think I will do is move the dropship uh, to somewhere where it can land behind a building safely. So, basically right here will be good enough, I believe. And we will do the go down move. So, go down and go down. And that means that we are descending. And if you descend more than two altitudes, and then altitude is an abstract unit of measurement for, for, uh, I suppose, for aerospace rules. It does not actually represent meters or anything. There is a representation of how many meters it is in the rulebook, but it is non-linear. It's uh, exponential. Or it's not exponential, it's um, maybe logarithmic would be a better way of putting it. And then we will also hover to make sure that we do not keep falling. Let's see here. Oh, did they not... What happened to that option? Movement. They turn prone. Select fortress. So move special, I think. I might have to do move special. Hover. There we go. And we'll do the move. Okay, so the enemy Chippewas are attacking. And the other one has not moved. Let's see here. Last time I checked, Princess didn't do double blind that well. Ah, greetings, Uk Ukpit Australis. Welcome to the convoy. I I'm not quite sure if Princess can handle this, but last time I tried it with her, she wasn't too bad. So we shall see, we shall see. If not, we will simply replay it. Okay, so, one of the interesting things about aerospace fighters is that they must, on the ground map, maintain a certain distance of travel before they can turn. And this represents the turning radius of an aircraft. Let's see here. But you have to declare that the, the hover vehicle as hovering. Shouldn't be assuming, assumed to be hovering unless you say it isn't. Oh, so the dropship is a massive, absolutely massive spacecraft. It is only represented as this small dot here, or small icon on the map, as one hex. When it lands, you'll see that it is significantly bigger. And for your reference, one of these hexes, at least on the ground map, is 30 meters across or so. But the mechs themselves do, are out of scale for the ground map. Let's see here. And on the actual tabletop, each of these hexes is approximately 1.3 uh, inches across. It's a very odd size. 1.3 inches. Alright, let's see here. But uh, for, for the dropship, the aerospace rules are a little bit different. So I do have to tell it to hover so it does not fall. Whereas these winged craft can actually do that without too much care. So what I will do is I will simply fly forward and not accelerate with my chip with my uh, Gothas. So I will move, and as you can see, the enemy fighters have attempted to attack me. So what I'll do is I will complete my aerospace movement by simply flying forward and letting them tail me. And I might do some aerospace maneuvers to uh, to to basically go around them. So let's see. All of my forward-facing aerospace weapons cannot shoot at anything. and But I do have aft lasers that can hit. 
Now, normally medium lasers have a very short range, but because we are playing aerospace, which is an entirely different rule set on a ground map, the way the rules are played is incredibly different. So we can actually attack one of these Chippewas. So what we will do is fire both of our aft lasers on one of them, and on the other one, we will also fire both of our aft lasers at a singular Chippewa. So that one is done, and this one must now also do the same thing. And there we go. Done. And our dropship will not fire because that's not its job. There we go. So the enemy, so the Gotha, both, it hits one of the Gotha, Chippewas, with both of its rear-facing lasers here. And the other Gotha hits, hits the other Chippewa. All right, here we go. So one of the Chippewas, because it took damage, must now make a piloting skill check. As you can see, the numbers are pretty bad, and the chance of your fighter craft simply lawn darting into the ground, which is an expression used to say that it crashes, is very high. So imagine if instead of base piloting skill 2, it was 5. That craft would have needed 3 more, so a 6. And 6 is getting dangerously close to a a half chance of not happening in a 2d6 based system so it is a it's a bit of a problem this is why i make sure that i i have house rules or i use a much better piloting skill let's see here old rules had different templates for different dropships new rules generalize into a three by th three hex circle for spheroids or a three hex long brick for aero dropships indeed upika australis that is how they do it now so even though the fortress may be significantly larger than the uh, than the smaller dropships, it will appear to be the same size. Oh, goodness me. I'm glad that you're enjoying the music. Lawn darting is used in horse riding, too. Oh, I did not know that. It's a good expression. It's a very good expression. The program for the game looks like a little old. Which years was it made? I believe it was started in 2000, perhaps? No, no, or maybe 2010. Oh, my goodness. I'll have to look it up. One second, please. Let's see, Mega Mech. Let's see, when Mega Mech actually uh, was developed. Let's see here. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. And Mega Mech homepage. When did it start? It unfortunately has been some time since I've checked that number. Da, 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 da. Mega Mech. Mega Mac, um, start date. Let's see here. Oh my goodness. I, I am having trouble. I cannot find the date. Oh, okay, so 2000. Fantastic, fantastic. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a rather old program, but it has had a lot of improvements since then. Okay, so because we are playing double double blind, we only know initiative, which we have lost by rolling lower. This means that we have to move first, and in the simultaneous move system of Battletech, moving second or moving first is a problem because the enemy will see where you go. So we always want to make sure our initiative is, is good. So let's keep going down with the dropship. So we're going to... Oh, it wants me to do artillery attacks. I keep forgetting that this particular dropship is artillery. Alright. So Princess is making some moves. Uh, where did she go? Where did she go? Okay. So now we have to make an aerospace move. So why don't we go down twice. And we're not quite ready to land. And if we go down any further, we will have issues. So let's do that. But in the meantime, let's also drop some troops. Let's see here. Ah, I forgot that. Uh, da, da, da. Let's drop both elementals. Oh, we can only drop one elemental group because there's only one door. That is still better than nothing. All right, and done. Okay, so as you can see, we've deployed some elemental dr elemental troopers despite the dropship not being on the ground yet. And that's because they're slow, so I want them to get a head start in their attack into the city. All right, so now the Gothas must move. I think what I will do 
is I will accelerate by one. Actually, I may do a maneuver, so I will do more. I will accelerate to get one speed. I will probably do a maneuver. I will do a hammerhead, which should turn me around. Let's see here. Yes, yes. So basically, the aircraft dueling system in Battletech is rather advanced, and it has different heights, different bearings, and it also has different maneuvers that you can pull off. So it's incredibly detailed. So let's try to do that maneuver. Oh, I forgot that it's a very difficult maneuver. We are not going to do that. <laughs> what we're going to do instead is accelerate so that we don't stall out. Uh, basically, the way speed for aircraft works in Battletech is you you essentially can accelerate at the beginning of your turn, and that will force you to move a certain number of hexes. And the speed at which you are at changes how well you can turn. And that is much better on the aerospace map because uh, playing on the ground map is difficult because the scale is so much bigger. But it is a very good way of portraying now this sort of thing. Atmo combat is completely different from space uh, from space combat indeed. Space combat, especially if you use the vector rules, can be an incredibly uh, slippery and delicate sort of thing. But not a lot of people play warships or space combat, especially with the vector rules. Let's see. So we're gonna base. We're going to go around here and turn around. Let's see here. And we should be able to turn around without having to having to eventually end up. Uh, Oh my goodness. Oh, we have discovered an enemy mech. We have discovered the Grenadier and some kind of sensor platform by flying over it. So we will do the exact same maneuver with our other Gotha in order to keep things simple. So let's see here. Let's, uh, let's go here and accelerate. There we go. Accelerate by one and move along. There we go. Everyone uses Newtonian option rule. It works better than Atmo-ish rules in space. Ah, yes, yes. I, I agree with that, Upik. I think that um, the Newtonian rules are more intuitive and they allow for proper broadside sweeps uh, that, that really make the game a lot more interesting, and especially the rollover maneuvers. So as you can see, the enemy is in... Enemy is somewhere here. And I am guessing that that princess is actually functioning... Uh, because, as you can see, she is no longer in the deployment zone, and she has moved ahead, which is a great sign. Alright, so... Now it's our turn to do aerospace shooting. We can actually target some of these enemies, and we'll target the battle armor because we can. So we'll use our medium lasers, and the way aerospace targets on a ground map, as you see this blue line here, that is the path that our craft took. And in essence, any unit shooting an aircraft, and the aircraft shooting themselves, will use this line to determine closest distance. So for example, aircraft can only attack directly down on this line. They're strafing. And this means that this Gotha can only attack the battle armor that the enemy has. Um, at the same time, any enemy mech that has line of sight to the Gotha will be able to shoot it. Uh, Thanks to the thanks to the way that the rules work in this favor. So, let's see here. You're so lost in the rules, but I'm loving the, watching the evolving the situation evolve here. I'm, gl I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, this one will be will be evolving very quickly, very soon. This might get a little bit hairy. Is that a line of mechs? Uh, it appears that we have two mechs and that we have some battle armor. Let's see here. And battle armor is essentially power armor, but typically bigger and generally mm, less humanoid, or at least the weapon mounts are mounted to the armor rather than held, typically. So why don't we use some some missiles? We have plenty of missile. Actually, no, missiles are reserve ammo that we would like to save for fighting the aerospace fighters that the enemy has. There we go. So that one is done, and now the next Gotha will also attack the, the very same squad. Let's save our 
Let's save our missile ammo because we have so little of it. And that is it for now. There we go. Okay, so the dropship will not shoot because we are playing by gent gentlemen's rules. All right, so the Gotha takes a shot at the mag shots. It misses with most of them. And one of the troopers is nearly killed. So a battle, battle armor trooper will have one, one point of structure representing the soldier within, and then a certain point, number of points of armor, typically at least one. And once all of the armor is gone, and the trooper is gone, then the armor is destroyed. So let's see, we hit another one. Oh, we managed to get a singular kill. And one of these squads has actually shot at us. In fact, more than one may have shot at us. Let's see here. Yeah, that is a bit of a problem. The enemy is doing their darndest to attack our Gothas. Let's see if we have a piloting skill check. So we do have a piloting skill check. As, as we took some amount of damage in aerospace mode. Which, as you can see, is, is why this is absolutely terrible. Uh, this is why you house rule this. Or why you make all of your pilots skilled. Because it is so easy to lose a fighter to simply crashing. Even though the actual internal mechanisms of the craft are perfectly intact. So we can finally land. So let's skip this artillery phase. And let's make... Oh my goodness, I might kill my elementals because I launched them. Alright, so Princess is moving. She might have to be thinking a little bit harder because it is double blind. But as you can see, she has moved away. Alright, and if I recall, line of sight for aircraft when scouting out ground targets is dependent on their elevation. So aircraft that are higher up will generally uh, be much more difficult, will have a diff more difficult time uh, to see the enemy. Okay, so let's make sure we land. So we need to, let's see here, more, more, more. We need to... Go down. Where is go down? Oh, no. We can't go down because we're at elevation 1. We're simply going to vertically land. And this will end our movement. And we need a 0 because our pilot is good. And also guarantee... Oh, and there is the dropship as a, as a generic icon that is used to indicate when a dropship lands. There you are, wingmates. As you can see, it's a spheroidal dropship. Oh. Oh, goodness. What is it doing? Da, 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 da. It's a spheroid dropship and it has some mounts for weapons and it has these landing legs that are visible from the top down and ramps of course. So we are now forced to maneuver our Gotha again. Let's zoom out a little bit. Oh the enemy has a fire starter which is their scout mech coming in and now that our fighters are lower they have a higher radius of detection. Am I building a cat bot? Ah, greetings, Legion. Welcome to the convoy. Uh, we are actually playing uh, some Mega Mech for once instead of designing for it. So, the Gotha will try to circle around. So what we'll do is we will accelerate by one and we will attempt to turn. Let's see here. So we, we can already turn at this particular junction. And we will have to use thrust in order to turn, I believe. Because we are getting... Oh, no. We are getting too close to the edge here. And we did not have to use thrust to get away. So one of the interesting things is that aerospace fighters must move a certain distance. So it is very difficult to get them to work. The enemy got a Drew Barrymore. Uh, which one is a Drew Barrymore, Legion? I, I would I'm interested in knowing which one you perceive as such. So we will accelerate... And we will move to the same position, because both the Gothas are riding on top of one another. Oh, and we killed our battle armor accidentally by landing on them. Oops. <laughs> so as you can see, the Scorpion made, made an error by going very fast on pavement, which may cause issues for vehicles. Essentially, pavement is slippery, because your feet or your treads cannot dig into the, into the terrain. Making, making it possible for you to skid if you begin changing your direction too rapidly. And in the rules, this is represented by a piloting skill check 
to skidding uh, for both mechs and vehicles in case you are running or flanking, uh, both being equivalent modes of movement, and you make a turn without stopping. One second, please, wingmates. I require a little bit of hydration for my simulation. Oh, the fire starter. The fire starter is a very interesting mech. It's a... Uh, I, I think it is a... Handy scout design. <sighs> Battle armor, bros. Indeed, indeed. They uh, they did suffer. They did suffer, indeed. But their, their demise was quick. As you can see, they've taken 33 damage, which is more than enough to overkill them. So at the very least, they didn't uh, they didn't feel anything. Or hopefully not for long. Oh, the enemy is very much charging in. So we have no targets for our aircraft. Even the helicopters that are flying around, the enemy ones, we cannot target unless we fly directly over them. So right now, we have no valid targets, unfortunately. I'm going to move this minimap over here. All right, let's keep going. The other one, the other Gotha, also has nothing it can do. So the dropship will not shoot due to gentlemen's agreements. But I would like to unload, but... Hmm. Okay, well, unfortunately, we will not be able to... We will not be able to shoot like this. So, we are done with the fortress. Okay. So, the Gotha is being shot at. The Atlas actually managed to hit it with an ER large laser right here. And every time an aircraft... Aircraft have certain values for their armor on different locations. And... In essence, the um, the the way that works is, uh, mm, ten percent of the armor points in a given location, such as a wing or the fuselage, uh, or nose or tail of an aircraft, they will exp potentially experience a critical hit, and that is used to represent how thin uh, fighter craft armor truly is, despite it actually having very significant armor values. Let's see here, and the Gotha took a... What did it take? This is clearly an LBX shot here, but apparently it must have been a target that I can't see. And as you can see, the Atlas fired a weapon, fired its Gauss rifle without being braced for shooting, so it had to make a piloting skill check. Which means it could have fallen over, potentially, just from shooting its primary gun. There we go. You said gentlemen's agreements a few times already. Is this an actual gaming rule or more of a cultural thing? Well, in this case, it is simply me not using the weapons on the dropship to challenge uh, to attack uh, to attack the bot, because the way I balanced the game was that I did not factor in the dropship because the enemy is not very good at using dropships. So as a result, I I simply refuse to use its weapons right now. Uh, let's see here. Even though it may distract the bot as a target, unfortunately. Ah, greetings, Niwa. Welcome to the convoy. Good to see you here. Okay, so. Let's continue on with the game. And our fighter did not did not lawn dart, luckily. Oh, goodness me. Okay. So, we have one initiative. So, we move last. Which means we get to align the shots as we need them. Fortress continues to do nothing. Princess is moving something. So we are now aware that the Atlas is has moved away, and the Thunderbolt is closing in along with the Scorpion and Firestarter. All right. So the Fortress needs to unload all of its units. So I think the first thing that we will unload will be the... Hmm... The Gallo Glass? No, no, the King Crab, because it has LBX cannons. And that will allow us... Uh, let's see, unload into coordinates. So the interesting thing is you can unload on various sides of a dropship. And we will use the dropship as cover. We're actually going to unload... Uh, we're actually going to unload into Hex 27. Hmm... Da, 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 da. 2723, I think. 
let's see here. So 27, oh, 27, 24 is the hex. Okay, so our king crab has deployed. Oh no. Oh no, can I only deploy one at a time? We're doomed, wingmates, we're doomed. We're gonna have to fight near the dropship because we can only deploy one at a time. Oh, I've forgotten that bit of a rule. I thought it was all, all, compat all functional doors will deploy. That is a problem. Well, we'll be all right. So for our movement, we will actually not do any movement because we want these VTOLs to get closer to us. All right, let's see here. Okay, so Fortress, what can you do? Da -da -da -da. Fortress can't do anything. Is the game jammed? Oh no, oh no. Uh, let's see here, movement. Movement, show possible moves. There is no possible movement. I guess we'll have to fake a move. Otherwise the game is jammed. That is a, that is a bit of a problem. Oh, there's a bug in the last few builds about doors and deployments from dropships. Ooh, that's a problem. Well, we may actually let the dropship now fire uh, because because we are at a disadvantage. And once we deploy the the, the remaining units, because this game is bugged, we, we will uh, then cease firing with the dropship. But otherwise, we need some guns. Oh, good. So Princess now knows about multi-doors. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for letting me know. Oop, oop. Ook pick. Sometimes the change logs are very long, and not all of the details come in. Okay, so our Gothas will be the ones helping us right now. So why don't we accelerate with the Gothas, and let's see how tight of a turn we can have. Let's back up, let's back up, back up. Mm, no, we won't be able to make it. We will have to accelerate twice. So one, two. Let's see if we can attack the fire starter. Nope. Uh, can we attack the Kestrels? Mm -hmm. I do wish to attack the Firestarter. Although we can simply continue our long sweep around. So why don't we attempt to move here? Yes, let's do a long sweep around. Right, come on, accelerate. And I think we'll actually go up. Because we want to be at elevation 5, so we don't have as much of a risk of crashing. In case we do get hit by weapons fire. So accelerate and go up twice, which will put us at movement. All right, so we're going to skirt the edge of the map, basically. There we go. And we should begin our turn, actually. Yes. Perfect. And we will have the other Gotha do the same thing. Accelerate and go up twice. Uh, you have to... Oh, we... Oh, no, we hit elevation six. That is a problem. We only need to go up once. There we go. And cancel all of that, actually. So accelerate and go up once. Uh, if you're above elevation 5, you can't do ground attacks, which is an error. All right, there we go. Da -da 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 -da. Ah, hello, Yukis. Welcome to the convoy. Good to see you here. Thank you for the clip, Headless. <laughs> we may be a little bit doomed here. And Headless, there is a rule for, for hot dropping. I actually did hot drop the battle armor, but um, unfortunately, I, I burnt them. But you can simply launch all of your your uh, units from the bays. So we're going to target the Kestrel with our LBX-20s. And we're going to use our LBX cluster ammo. Which will allow us to attack them more readily. So I'll shoot with one cannon. And I will shoot cluster ammo with another cannon. Both of the helicopter. And essentially, LBX using cluster ammo is a flak weapon. And that has a minus three bonus to hitting any airborne target, which is very handy for knocking out helos. And I don't think I actually fired that weapon. There it goes. Uh, let's see, do I want to shoot streaks at it? No, I don't. I think I'll just shoot an energy weapon at it. Simply because the energy weapon is significantly... It doesn't use any ammo. And perfect, we are right within our heat limit. We are at 24 heat for all of the heat that these weapons generated. So there we go. Uh, the Gotha can't hit anything, so we're done with the Gotha. We're done with the Gotha. And since our dropship is unavailable, we're going to target the Kestrel. And we will use 
our right side weapons, if I can find them. Let's see, right, left side, there we go. There we go, right side armament. Oh, and left side aft will actually work, I think. Wait, no, no. Let's see here, nose, nose cannot target. So nose weapons on a dropship can only target anything flying above. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, there we go. Let me, let me move the weapons info here. There you go, wingmates, I apologize about that. Greetings, Alaric, and welcome to the convoy. So now we're going to select the... So the nose weapons are useless, because they can't target uh, anything on this lower altitude. They can only target fighters in the sky. Uh, let's see, left side, left side, left side aft. Uh, the way this is arranged is always a little bit funny. Okay, here we go, right side. So we're going to shoot our ERPPCs at the Kestrel. So fire off that. And both of our LRM-20s, why not? We don't have any units, whereas normally we would be barraging with all of our available weapons. Why not? There we go. That should that should take care of that fighter. Okay, there we go. So the Kestrel apparently took a pilot injury. Interesting, how did the pilot injure themselves? I'm not actually quite sure. So they shoot the fortress, but as you can see, the armor of the fortress dropship takes very little damage. All right, so now we are... So we, we missed with both shots. We missed with all of our shooting for the King Crab. Very unfortunate. But luckily, the fortress has actually destroyed one of the Kestrels. As you can see, most of the weapons collided. And the, and the Kestrel had an engine hit, because it took damage on its various components. It had a rotor hit, and it had its rotor blown off. So in essence, oh, and it had its crew killed. So that particular helicopter was shredded. Absolutely shredded. I believe that the pilot spilled his scalding hot coffee on his lap because the craft shook. That could potentially be the case. Uh, uh, you can take piloting damage for some of the silliest reasons in Battletech. Although, most often it is because your mech falls over. Okay. Oh, a fire started. Oh, goodness. So, according to rules, the rules of the game, if something crashes, if lasers miss in a hex with flammable material, or if uh, certain other such things happen that could potentially start a fire, you have a chance. And as you can see, we rolled a chance of a fire start on a building. So this is going to be very interesting. There's going to be a lot of smoke billowing from that. Okay, so we don't—we're not doing any artillery with the with the fortress. So the crab, I think we will want to start moving the crab mm, around the building to protect one of our flanks, and to also get some data as to what exactly is going on right now. So what we will do is we actually move to this flank here. Uh, let's see here. Da, da, da. We'll have to run the crab, I think. Unfortunate, but I need data. There we go. Uh, we'll pass those checks. Yes, we managed to pass both of those pavement checks. All right, so the fortress should now unload units. So let's take a look. And let's do unload. Ooh, this is going to be a problem. Let's unload the next heaviest mech that we have. We have a gallo glass. And the coordinates should be... Let's go with 2425. Or 2425, there we go. So we've unloaded the gallo glass. And, yep, the bug is hitting us. We cannot unload more than one type of unit at a time. In spite of us obviously needing to be able to do that. So we're going to have to defend the dropship while this happens. Oh, yes, yes, uh, it, it certainly does have dropship interaction rules. In fact, there are rules for orbital fire. They're just not implemented. In fact, th the way that the aircraft are being played on this particular map is one of my least favorites. I much prefer uh, playing the aerospace map where you have um, traditional aerospace movement and not ground map movement. Ground map movement is one of the worst things I have ever played but it's the only way to do aircraft in conjunction with, uh, I suppose, mechs on the ground in Mega Mech. 
Right, so our Gallo Glass is out. And we should probably get, get it moving so that we can see what that what is going on in the field. So let's make sure that we move it into position here. Although we'll probably want to walk because this is all pavement after all. Actually, we'll just move forward. Or maybe we'll rotate this way. I'm not quite sure. Ah, goodness me. Ah, so many risks involved with pavement. And there we go. So let's do that move. Alright, so... Oh, we can keep unloading. There we go. So let's make sure we unload the bushwhacker into a different set of coordinates. Let's go to 2724. 2724. And... Oh, no, I picked the wrong one. So let's make sure we turn and move forward a little bit. Okay, there we go. And let's keep unloading. So it appears that this is actually going okay. Hmm. There was an amazing screenshot of a Savannah Master skidding into an Overlord. It caused the Overlord to displace one hex. Technically correct by the patch the behavior. <laughs> uh, to anyone who is not aware, a Savannah Master, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ook, Ook Pit, Oopik, Ook Pick, I apologize. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the Savannah Master is a 5-ton hovercraft, which has absurd speed. And one of the classic uh, classic joke strategies, which is not really a joke, depending on the map type, is to have a swarm of Savannah Masters take down a force of mechs, simply due to numbers. So let's unload our scout mech into our coordinates up north, which would be 2623 in hex coordinates. There's the Raven. Okay. Perfect. So the Raven has unloaded, so we should have far more sensors. And what we will use the Raven for is for obtaining data. So let's take a look here. We do not want to turn on pavement. So we'll be very careful. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, I'm not turning on pavement. I refuse to do that. There we go. And can't really turn that way. Alright, we'll do that. And we didn't we didn't crash. So luckily our pilot passed the particular skill check. Let's see. Well volume of fire tends to win out in a lot of war games. Indeed it did. And TK, yes. A heart goes out to both chat and the lurkers. Alright, so let's keep unloading our dropship. Now, I think this behavior is bugged because you should not have been able to unload so many. But because it's cinematic, why don't we un unload everything? So we'll do that and we'll do the patent tank in coordinate 2425. So let's see here, 2425. And I messed that up again. So let's move the patent into combat position or slowly move it into combat position. No, we are not going to risk any more damage with the Patton. Actually, let's just simply rotate like this. And that is the same problem. There we go. Nope. Well, that's fine too. Let's just move. Hide behind the building. So we need to get sensor data as to what where the enemy is. So we'll use the Raven as a scout. Just a bunch of guys with one medium laser. Indeed, indeed. That's, that's all Savannah Masters can do. So let's keep unloading our, our tanks here. Alright, and the Patton can... The Patton can move through light woods, but I rather would not. So we'll, we're just going to move the Patton to this position and turn. There we go, and let's keep unloading. We'll unload the one of our scout helos, which should be rather handy. Okay, so there is our scout helo. Let's see, what is the height of buildings here? So we have height four buildings, uh, typically. And we have a height 15 building and another height 15. So I think height eight is one of the tallest. So for now, let's go up to height five uh, because elevation is a feature in this game. It's just very difficult to see sometimes. So go up one, two, three, four, five. There we go. So we are now at height five. And we should be able to have good line of sight to the enemy. 
at least those that are not hidden behind buildings. All right, and we can also move our helicopters out. There we go. So skidding in a helicopter is not as dangerous. You can fail it, and what that will mean is when your helicopter skids, as it takes a turn, there's a chance that it will continue moving forward in the direction that it used to be moving in before it turned. And that can be a problem if you're flying low, essentially a treetop level, and you skid into a tree. But in the air, the main difficulty is you may not line up a shot the way you want it to. Ah, hello, little S. Welcome to the convoy. Good to see you here. We are playing Mega Mech right now with a with a with a combat scenario we, where we have dropped in and are currently unloading a bunch of units in order to begin our attack against the AI player. So let's see, go up one, two, three, four, five elevations, and we can move this way to see what enemies are in this location. There we go, and I don't care if I skid. I really don't. And we'll keep unloading. In fact, we can't unload anything else. Let's see here. What is going on? Uh, sure. It's the last thing. I oh, the last thing we can unload is the battle armor. So that is what we will unload. So the dropship is now useless, but we do not want to be anywhere near it when it takes off. So we will simply have to skip its actions in combat. Okay. So our forces have deployed now that we have landed our dropship in the city. As you can see, Princess is coming in, and our sensors have managed to detect the presence of these enemies despite playing in double blind rules. Oh my goodness, the enemy is moving quite a bit. So our initial threat is this fire starter. So we're going to have to move our battle arrangement essentially into these alleyways and start engaging in what is going to be a fist fight. This is going to be a problem. And whoever loses helicopters first will be the first one to lose good line of sight in double blind. So we need to make sure we take out the other Kestrel. All right, so let's do aerospace movement uh, since all ground units have moved. And I want to knock out this these Chippewas. So what I will do is I will coast along. Actually, I will accelerate. Let's see here. Accelerate. And I will attempt to get into a position where I think the Chippewas might be. The Chippewas haven't moved yet, but what I do know is that they do have a mandatory minimum amount of distance they will have to move. And there is a good chance they will end up in my fire arc. So for this reason, I will attempt to have my nose facing facing roughly no 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 okay let's try this again so here we go so we accelerate to here and then we will go here and turn our nose actually we'll have to step back da, 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 da. and it won't let me turn because I turned fairly recently that is a problem but we should be okay we should be okay. And going further will not help us. So we'll see what happens with our firing line. And I don't I do not think we will actually get a good shot off this time around. That Chippewa went a lot faster than I anticipated. Mostly because that one is actually going on a ground attack mode. But we will shoot down that enemy Chippewa. Gameplay is generally similar to the tabletop space game we played last time. Well, it is similar in the sense that it is hexes, but Overall, this is a vastly different and much more detailed game than Triplanetary. So let's accelerate with the fighter so it doesn't fall down. In essence, you could have your fighter stall out, but that is not something I recommend. And we have moved our other, uh, other Stuka there. Alright, so these are all piloting checks. We don't care too much about them. It just means that our pilots have succeeded and not plopping their mechs onto the ground. Okay, so now I have to declare indirect attacks, and there is a tag on my Raven, which is a targeting acquisition gear used for essentially shooting missiles, or for targeting missiles that you can shoot from a distance, or for, I suppose, indirect fire and other such things. 
But we're not using that right now, so we're done. Okay. So, what can the King Crab shoot? It could shoot the VTOL at a plus 7, which means we are very unlikely to hit. None of the enemy mechs are in line of sight. So what we will do is we will actually shoot the Chippewa using our flak guns. So there we go, we're shooting that target. And let's see here. Target not in arc. How dare you? We're going to rotate our... Oh, we can't rotate our torsos, the crab. But the target is in arc. Oh, there it is. There we go. So let's see. We will shoot cluster ammo at it because it is much easier to hit it with cluster ammo. And we will take a pot shot with... Hmm, we'll take a pot shot with some... With a large... No, 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 we won't. That gives us more heat. There's no point in getting more heat right now. We'll just try to take shots using our streak racks. And streak racks are very interesting weapons in the game. So, normally short-range missile fours, or any of the short-range missile family, if you miss, the missiles will fire, but they will simply not be locked. Whereas streak weapons, uh, they're also streak long-range missiles, is if you miss a shot, the weapon will not fire. And you won't waste ammo, and you won't gain heat. Ah, Derp, I'm glad you're, you're getting some rest. I hope you uh, have an excellent sleep. Thank you for being with the convoy. Ah, uh, yes, yes, Urkulin. The, uh... I'm, I'm glad that you have uh, less work less work to deal with now. Yeah, so we've shot with our crab. And now we may attempt... Let's see, we can't attack any enemy mechs yet. We will attempt to shoot the Chippewa using our weaponry here. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's rotate. Why is it not letting me target the Chippewa? Target... Oh, yes. So one of the interesting things about aircraft is that you... Uh, the range to an aircraft is the distance between you and the closest point to its flight line, as indicated by these red lines here, uh, plus two for every elevation, every abstract elevation that the aircraft is at. Every, every, everyone is at. FYI, nukes and orbital artillery are possible from the console, but need the server password and a confirmation setting. Uh, true in three different dialogues. Yes, yes, uh, Ukpik. Uk you can certainly use nukes, but it is, uh, it is something you have to enable, because it basically ends the game then and there. There are actually rulebook rules for an atomic detonation of different sizes too. You can build a nuke in the rules of Battletech. But uh, it's very difficult to survive anything like that unless you're at the correct distance. Interesting, an interesting trade-off for streak weapons. I always love it when random fire missiles cause a knockdown or a crit. Indeed, indeed. Uh, the crits coming from, from missile racks is a lot of fun. Uh, streaks generally have the trade-off of being heavier than normal missiles. That is the main trade-off you gain in having that lock-on capability. So why don't we take a pot shot at the Chippewa using our Gauss rifle. We have quite a bit of ammo, we might as well use it. And we'll also use our large lasers. And we that is not much heat, so perfect, perfect. We're just taking pot shots to try to disable enemy aerospace. And this bushwhacker will also attack enemy aerospace. We'll use... Hmm, we'll use our medium lasers. Nope, it's out of range. So we'll have to use our ER large laser to shoot at the Chippewa, and then we will use our MMLs at long range in order to also fire some missiles at it. I think we also may use our plasma rifle. Although, how much ammo do we have? We don't have too much ammo for a plasma rifle. Mm, 10 to hit is not very good. A 16% chance. So I don't think we will do that, actually. So we're done with the bushwhacker. Now, the Raven. Uh, the Raven can actually also target the Chippewas that's flying by. Uh, let's see here. We will use our MML with Artemis-capable long-range ammo, because I doubt we will be using that much in the city. There we go. And we are done with everything that could shoot. Now, the Patton. Can the Patton shoot? We can shoot with the AC-10, but uh, why not? Why not? Let, let's do AC-10 shooting. There we go. And 
the other Patton will also rotate its turret and shoot. There we go. And shooting. Hopefully we'll knock that Chippewa out. Let's see. And we can actually begin attacking the some enemies here, but our Sprint Scout helicopter unfortunately is out of range. Although we can attack this VTOL, but there is no chance of hitting it. As you can see, let's take a look at the modifiers. Four is the base skill to, to attack with this particular pilot. The attacker flanked, which gives it a plus two. And the target was moving 10 to 17 hexes in a turn. And that is pretty fast, so we have a huge penalty to hit it. And the target is a VTOL, which is just a flat bonus. And it's at long range. So as you can see, it's a 15 to hit, which means we cannot do it. All right, and with this helicopter, we also can't do any shots, unfortunately. All right. Let's see, so the... Unfortunately, our Chippewas cannot attack, or our Gothas cannot attack the Chippewas. Let's see here. Do we have any rear arc shots that we could do? Let's see. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah, target not an arc. And aft is also out of orc, so we, we cannot do anything with aerospace right now. Okay. And the dropship will not attack due to our gentleman's agreement with Princess. Alright, so let's see what happened. So the King Crab actually managed to hit with an LBX, and it did a significant number of damage, 12 pellets, to the Chippewa, and that's scattered all across the fuselage. And it managed to land a single hit with this streak rack. So the nice thing about the streak racks is it's an all or nothing weapon. If all of the weapons hit, or if you hit, you hit with all of the missiles. It's not like a typical cluster weapon where if you hit, you must then also roll to see how many pellets hit or how many missiles hit. So we, we've done some good damage to the Chippewa so far. We missed with the Gauss rifle on the Galahad. We hit with an MML-5. We had a critical chance using the Bushwhacker. So the Chippewa attacked our dropship, which we won't really care about now. Uh, let's see here. The Chippewa attacked our Bushwhacker and did some damage to the rear torso and legs. I don't like that. I don't like this, I don't like this uh, Chippewa. Ooh, yeah, it did some significant damage to our Bushwhacker. Ooh, that is not good. All of our tanks missed. Everything else missed. And the Centurion shot at our Fortress Dropship. Oh, because the Fortress Dropship is taller than the buildings. So it actually it actually managed to land a critical hit on the nose. And now one of the uh, systems is offline. But luckily that's Artemis 5, which is a fire control system for weapons. And we really don't care about that. Okay, so bo both Chippewas had to make control rolls. And they succeeded, obviously. But they are starting to take damage. And more smoke has... More fires have started. This is very interesting. Okay, so here we go. Indirect attacks, none, because the dropship isn't firing. So I want to isolate and destroy as many of the enemy mechs as I can. Which is good, because they will not have nearly as much firepower to shoot back. And I think I will isolate the fire starter if I can. So, in order to en enact that, I will move the crab forward. There we go. Crab moving forward. And I think I will also move the Galahad forward to support the advance. Perfect. <laughs> excellent, excellent. We need to go around this building complex here. Or else it will be very difficult for us. What was the Centurion? Oh, the Centurion is actually advancing inward. One of the enemy's uh, short-range missile carriers is pulling into this position. That is an ambush weapon with thin armor, but it can be very, very dangerous. And I will not split my forces, so the Bushwhacker will actually turn around now and join the King Crab. However, I will split forces for my scout mech, and I will actually try to scout out where the enemy positions are. Uh, 
normally scouting is not very helpful in typical battle tech because you know exactly where the enemy is. But in this situation, it very much helps. Uh, because we are double blind, so we are not exactly sure where the enemy is. So we want to get sensors on target. And we will move this pattern forward. Basically, we are trying to create a death ball to attack the enemy. Let's see here. We will actually now move our elementals. So the elementals can jump, luckily. And that is what they'll do. They'll slowly advance towards the building. Because... Oh, we actually moved fast, so they will not be able to shoot. There's an infantry bonus movement rule. Oh, so now we have a sensor return, but that mech is un unknown to us. I think that might be... Hmm, what could that be? Let's see. So our dropship is done. So one of the interesting things is because you take turns moving units, but you, as the player, choose when to move units, um, it is fully possible to have units that you don't want to move until later. Um, and you basically use them as a filler. So for example, I made the mistake. I should have actually moved the fortress first, by not moving the fortress. And that is that is because the um essentially it it can do nothing. It's useless. So I may as well get get it rid get rid of it in the sequence of turns that I have to do. Can the elementals hide in the buildings? Yes, Attenborough, and that's what I'm going to try to do. Is hide the battle armor in the building. So both of the sprint he scout helicopters are now essentially that building is too high. So we can actually move higher in order to avoid some more of these buildings. We need to actually move to elevation 8. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up 1, 2, 3. And that should put us at elevation 8, which it did. And we will essentially start scouting with our, with our helos. We're going to take a look at where the enemy is. And hopefully we won't skid into the skyscraper. And I don't think we did. We survived that that uh, that skid opportunity. So now Princess is moving somewhere. Oh, she's pulling back. And one of her mechs has actually entered the building. Or this might be a sensor return. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. Oh, 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 there is a Thunderbolt pulling in. And that blasted VTOL has also pulled in. Oh, and the fire starter did a jump. That is a problem. Let's see. Okay, so I will have to move the sprint scout helicopter. Hmm, what kind of weapon do I have? I don't have a very good weapon. So what I do care more about is getting data. Actually, no, we will use this for combat. So what the sprint can do is it can go forward it can go forward, and then it can come back. And then, one, let's see, one, two, three. It'll be in short range. And that way, essentially, the helicopter will zoom around, quickly turn around, and come back. And the fact that it moves faster will make it much harder to hit, even though in displacement terms, it has not actually moved that much on the map. So path is also important. Not necessarily just... um. Just motion. So let's see, has the Centurion moved? So the Centurion moved. So now we will actually attempt a ground attack maneuver. So this Gotha, which is at elevation 6, we actually must make it go down a little bit. Or else it will crash. Or else it won't be, won't be very helpful. And that's a problem because for some reason the game is not giving me the velocity bonus for going down. So I will have to accelerate and go down simultaneously. And we'll go on the Centurion. So basically, as we fly over the Centurion... Oh, modifier 3, that's not good. What's the Thunderbolt? Where did the Thunderbolt go? This is what happens when you play double blind. You don't know where the enemy units are. And at this point, I have lost track of the Thunderbolt. So my best bet might be to attack... Hmm... I could also attack the SRM carrier. 
because that is coming in and it it's a much easier chance to destroy the SRM carrier. So what I will do is I will go down, or I will accelerate, and then I will go down and I will attack the SRM carrier. And hopefully I won't explode in, in doing so. There we go. So that's one of the Gothas, and the other Gotha... Oh, we're having a flyby with the Chippewas, nice. And I will attempt to attack... Yes. Oh, and one of the Chippewas left the map. And the enemy Kestrel has skidded here, as you can see. And that side slip meant that it, it uh, essentially went further than it wanted to by one hex. Okay, so. Here we go. Okie doke. Declare indirect attacks. We're not doing any tag, so we don't have to do that. Okay, so. What are we going to shoot? Unfortunately, I once again have issues targeting because I can't I cannot target I cannot target the king crab has a horrible quirk it can't rotate its torso and its arms are stuck facing forward so it's uh while it has two very heavy weapons if if you don't face them the right way you are doomed so alas the king crab will have to sit out this turn I don't know what's going on, but this is very enjoyable to watch. Ah, Shadow Trooper, welcome to the convoy. Uh, this is... I also don't know what's going on at times, but I'm glad that you enjoy it. Yes, the crab is a little like its namesake. It's a little immaneuverable. So the Gallo Glass, on the other hand, can actually attack the Chippewa. So we will attack the enemy Chippewa, hopefully. There we go. So the Gauss Rifle should be able to give it a good smack if we hit. Let's see what our range is. Let's see what our range is. 10 to hit. No, we're not going to waste any Gauss ammo on that. But we will do a large laser strike. And hopefully luck will help us hit the enemy with that. Okay, there we go. Galaglass is fired. Bushwhacker has nothing else in sight. So the Bushwhacker will attack the Chippewa. Oh, no, no. The Bushwhacker could attack this VTOL. But rotates. And we're actually at short range, so let's do our best to attack it. Let's use our MML launchers, which are missiles. And we will use our long-range laser to attack the VTOL. Unfortunately, I don't have a flak weapon, but otherwise that would have been much more helpful. So now the Raven is due to an attack, but it has no targets, so the Raven will simply stick around. So I, what I'm hoping is that the Raven will distract the enemy once they detect it. And I will have a greater chance of maneuvering my mech force into position to bash into up their center. Or maybe take down individual units so that then I could concentrate my forces on the Atlas, which is my biggest threat on the battlefield right now. The rules are Greek to me, but I'm enjoying imagining all the lasers and stuff. I'm glad, I am glad. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, and the Patton, I think, will take a pot shot at the at the fighter sweeping overhead. Because why not? Let's see here. Any chance to hit is a good chance to hit. Oh, I'm a fool. I should have shot at the fire starter. So let me turn my turret around. And I will use my autocannon 10 to attack the fire starter. And I will also use my medium lasers to attack it. There we go. That should be a little bit better. And this one will also attack the fire starter with a medium laser. And this Sprint Scout helicopter cannot attack anything. There we go, we're done with that. Now we move on to the aerospace phase. The, let's see, so target the SRM carrier. So we are going to attack with our weapons payload here. Uh, da, 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 small lasers, small lasers. And I think because we want to kill this as soon as possible, we will also attack with the missiles. There we go. And small laser. No, no, no. Let's see here. Can we fire that? LRM 15. No, we will overheat if we fire that. What if we scroll that back? Da, da, da. Okay, I'm gonna have to back up some weapon shots here. There we go. Firing with that. Fire alarm 15. Fire alarm 15. 
And we're going to overheat, and overheating is a piloting skill check. So I will not do that. That is a bad idea. Very bad idea. And can I hit the enemy Chippewa with a medium laser to the rear? Uh, if I do a ground attack, and a ground attack is much more valuable to me right now. Basically, you cannot attack both ground and air simultaneously. I've almost forgotten that bit. Alright, let's see. So I will keep attacking the with the other Gotha, the other fighter. I will do a ground attack against target SRM carrier. And the SRM carrier is essentially a missile rack, a gigantic one, on top of tracks. And it's used as an ambush weapon. Let's see, there we go. There we go. That should be acceptable. Perfect. And the dropship will do nothing. Alright. Let's take a look at what happened during this combat round. So, the Chippewa missed with its lasers. But it did hit... Oh, no! So this is why vehicles suck. The Patton was hit by an SRM-6 rack from the Chippewa enemy fighter, and what happened was it got a critical hit, and the engine was destroyed, and the tank is now immobile. So it's basically a turret. Very, very annoying. Very annoying. And, let's see, Gal Glass missed, the fortress keeps getting hit, and the fortress keeps getting hit. We're probably going to lose the fortress, actually. Because the enemy keeps focus firing on it. Uh, we managed to hit one of the fire starters with a medium laser, which is not great. And the Gotha manages to at least somewhat damage the SRM carrier. And one of the SRM carriers is actually destroyed. So the Gothas did their job as a ground attack craft. Perfect, perfect. Yep, yeah, tank bros get really blown out. This game is terrible if you like tanks. Even with vehicle effectiveness rules. This is terrible, terrible, terrible stuff. Well, great. Our Patton is worthless right now. <laughs> we have lost a significant amount of our battle value, but so did the enemy. They lost their SRM carrier. Although the Patton was worth a lot more, to be frank. Okay, physical attacks. Uh, I will not declare any physical attacks. I'm not going to kick a building. Uh, generally, any mech can physically attack a anything, as long as it's an enemy, and a building technically counts as an enemy. Okay, let's see what's happening here. Okay, so... Let's see... Indirect attacks again? No, because we're not using artillery. I believe dropships are something like a minus two or a minus four. To be hit. I think it might be a minus four because it's an immobile building. But I don't remember. It's been a while since I've shot at dropships. So the fortress is done because it has nothing to do. We'll make it make sure it moves first. We want the crab to move last because its positioning is the most valuable. On the other hand, we can actually hmm, we can actually maneuver the raven into the city without too much concern. Let's make sure we don't slam into a building by sprinting and turning at the same time. So we're gonna we're gonna go flanking with the Raven and hopefully get sensor contacts with it too. Let's see here. So the Patton, I think we'll move it in and we will hopefully discover what enemies are available. Ah, the Thunderbolt is there, perfect. So, we will probably lose this Patton, but that is okay. As long as the enemy keeps staying where they are. So, the Gallo Glass will join the Patton in its position here. And we are going to engage the Thunderbolt, hopefully. And the Crab will also move into position. May have to do a bit of a sprint. Let's see here. He can make it. Yes, so the Crab has made it to the Alleyway of Death that we are slowly constructing here. And this will be a problem. Okay, and the Bushwhacker. You know, the Bushwhacker will actually stay around here because the Bushwhacker needs to deal with... It needs to deal with the Firestarter. 
Let's hopefully we won't fall over. We did not fall over. The fire starter is a problem. Little Steiner propaganda for the stream. Ah, let's take a look at this. Ah, yes, the remastered opening sequence. That is that is a fantastic one. The inner sphere. I, I forget the I forget the the words to it. Right, so now we can move our elementals. Let's have them jump. So they're going to actually jump on top of this building right here. Has the fire starter moved? No, it has not. So the elementals will jump to the top of the building so they could actually do something. There we go. All right, here we go. My home planet. Okay, so now we have to move one of our sprint scout helicopters. And I think what we will do is we will move it into position with the Centurion. We will speed forward with the helicopter, and we will speed back. And we'll be at medium range. One, two, three, four. Hmm. Okay, well, what we will do is we will speed forward and also move sideways, I think. Yes. There we go. And we will back up a little bit here, and we will simply turn around. No, we can't do that either. We're simply gaming the system right now, wingmates. We're gaming the system to get the optimal uh, modifier for our helicopter. There we go. That should be perfect. And I don't care if it skids. It sidesteps two hexes. We'll see where it ended up. And we don't have much movement left. Alas, we failed with our maneuver. Our side slip failed completely. <laughs> quite solid, to, quite solid strategic game. A bit polish, and it could actually hit bigger. Uh, Mega Mech, unfortunately, I don't think we'll ever have more polish, because it is so fundamentally limited to this that the graphics. This is good graphics for Mega Mech. It's been it's been some time since uh since it's uh been up uh, in essence. This is this is about as good as it'll get as it'll get for now, but it does replicate the tabletop very well. And the tabletop is slow. That is something you have to accept about it. He said the thing. <laughs> uh, hello, A hello, Ari. Welcome to the convoy. Good to have you here. <laughs> this is the inner sphere. Thousands of planets colonized by humankind. Once it was united under the Star League. But for the last 300 years, it has been consumed by savage wars. Until a new enemy appeared. Mysterious invaders known as the clans. Powerful and ruthless, they struck like lightning, attacking every sector at once. But they made one big mistake. They attacked my home planet. Now, in the spirit of the Star League, ancient enemies have reunited. And we're gonna take back our galaxy. Yes, yes, that's a fantastic intro. Uh, the engine works very well. I'm sure that if you put some interesting graphics to this, it would sell quite a bit more. Mega Mech in Ultra 4K HD. You could actually play this in 4K. It's just my resolution is not 4K. I guess that's as far as emulating tabletop games goes for now. Uh, well, Battletech the video game did fairly well, but you cannot do... You cannot play double blind. Well, actually... There's some things you can't do. You can't control dropships, which I think is something I very much enjoy. So we will move the Sprint Scout helicopter here and essentially attempt to backstab some of the enemy. And hopefully that will work. Actually, it won't work, but we'll do it anyways. Yeah, that was not a very good maneuver, but we'll, we'll keep going. All right, there we go. Oh, the Thunderbolt appears to have sidestepped. Oh no, there's the Thunderbolt. Oh, this is a problem. This is a problem. As you can see, urban combat is very crazy. It is one of the most difficult ways of fighting in Battletech. <laughs> you refuse my Bachal? Uh, Bachal is a clanner term for essentially a... a, a duel or a battle with a wager. 
Oftentimes that wager is honor or equipment or knowledge. It is it can be anything in clan or society. Or I suppose that there are many trials to which you have a bachal. And a bachal uh there's some nuance to bachal that I'm not able to get across right now. It has become such a meme word that uh Yes, battle challenge. Thank you, TK. It is has become such a meme word to say, you dare refuse my bachal in the Battletech community that I've even forgotten what the proper uh, use use of bachal ends up being. Refuse your what? The cartoon had fantastic lines. Okay, so we need to make sure that our Gotha is actually airborne and we need to go up one hex. And now we need to prepare for another attack by the Gotha. So I think what we'll actually do is sweep around and attack the Scorpion. Let's move here. There we go. And we'll do the exact same thing with this Gotha. We'll accelerate, go up, and we will maneuver to fly over the Scorpion. And hopefully we will kill the Scorpion. So the other Chippewa left the map and we had a bunch of uh, piloting failures. Okay, so why don't we... Why don't we... Do some. Oh, again, tag. I really wish I could disable some of these phases. Just tell the game, I'm not doing this. So the crab has nothing it can hit. Unless it's the scorpion at the lo at long range. Oh, no, but we do have this VTOL that we can attempt. To no, it's out of arc and we can't twist our torso. Blast it. So we'll have to use our large laser that is also out of range. Scorpion can't do anything. Or... King Crab cannot do anything this turn. So much for that. The Gallo Glass is blocked. It can't attack. And even with the Gauss Rifle... Oh, with the Gauss Rifle, it can't... Oh, that is a terrible to hit number. So, as you can see, these range brackets, the Gallo Glass is a Gauss Rifle, which can go from short, medium, and long range. And it's much harder to, to attack at long range. Apologies, Wingmates. Another simulation hiccup. Um, we could hit the Scorpion technically, but we need an 11 to hit it on a 2d6, which is an 8.3% chance, which is absolutely dismal. We're not going to waste ammo. Especially not on a Scorpion. So, what is our Bushwhacker doing? Where did that... The fire starter jumped away, so the best thing we have is this VTOL that we could hit. But unfortunately... Even with our long-range weapons, the numbers to hit it are pretty bad. So we'll just have to wait for now. Uh, Raven can't hit anything. Oh, Raven, could it hit? Yes, it could actually attack the Scorpion. Nope. The MM... Too much of a modifier to hit it. Too much of a modifier. There's trees in the way. Okay, and... Unfortunately... Where is our turret rotation? Let's see, turret... Turret twist... The turret should be locked. Okay, so we actually do have an Ultra Auto Cannon 20 available. It's just we can't rotate the turret on this particular weapon. On this particular tank. So we will simply attempt our best bet to attack the... The, um... The VTOL. And we'll be using Ultra Mode because at this point it's a Hail Mary. So what Ultra Mode is, is on Ultra Auto Cannons, you can basically, um rip off or fire off two shots instead of one, but you risk a jam on a Snake Eyes roll. And Snake Eyes is simply one on two six-sided dice. Or one on each of the two, two six-sided dice. So it's a low chance, but it's a chance nonetheless, and you burn through more ammo. But, because the tank is already basically garbage, we can afford to have that chance. And unfortunately, again, we have no valid targets. They're all hiding behind buildings. So let's keep moving on. And this warrior will attack this centurion firing its medium laser and this one cannot attack except for the thunderbolt at a 13 plus we cannot hit at all there we go so the chippewas or the gothas will attack the scorpion so let me make sure the target is correct so target target scorpion and let's see if we can blast or at least disable that vehicle so at the very least, we can make this balance a little bit better for us. There we go. Done with that. And we are going to target the other scorpion. 
shoot most of our missiles at it. There we go. Perfect. Kill the scorpion. All right. The dropship will do nothing. And the elementals can actually shoot at the thunderbolt. So I will use my micro laser, which will not do much damage. And I will use my SRM 2. Actually, can I use... How much damage will the auto rifle do? Not much, so let's use that too. We'll, we'll save the SRM for better to hit numbers. All right, so the Kestrel misses the King Crab with its SRM-2, the Patton misses, the Sprint uh, Helicopter misses. So the Gothas are now ripping apart the Scorpion. They do quite a bit of damage. The Atlas attacks the Fortress at distance, and the other Gotha destroys the Scorpion. So we've taken out two of the enemy vehicles in exchange for one of ours effectively disabled. The enemy Thunderbolt criticals the damaged Patton and blows its turret off. As you can see, vehicles absolutely blow in Battletech, but they're still fun to use sometimes. You just have to accept that they will probably pop off before they have given any of their value to you. And the Gotha takes some damage, of course. Just a little bit, a scattering of pellets. Let's see, Galaglass has physicals, we're not going to kick the building. And the Raven won't kick a building either. Okay, so luckily our Gotha does not fall despite being hit. And the fires continue to spread where they were ignited. Okay. Let's see here. Indirect attacks, once again, I keep forgetting that that is very pointless. Okay, let's make sure we do this the right way. So what the elementals will do is they will actually, they'll actually go down, which means they enter the building and have more protection and they will move forward. There we go. So the elementals are now inside of this building and they will be able to shoot out from it, but they are protected by the building from damage by enemy mechs. So let's see here, let's make sure our dropship moves, because it's technically a ground unit, although it has no functionality whatsoever at this point. Hmm, we want to make sure our King Crab moves last, so let's actually move the Raven right now, because it's a scout unit for us. Let's see here, we definitely want, we, we want more sensor contacts. So we will move here, and attempt to get good line of sight on the enemy, so that we can take these pot shots at them. Oh, by moving closer, we have detected that there is another sensor return in the building. Those probably are battle armor, actually. I'm going to guess that uh, the same icon is used for battle armor as it is used for, for mechs. So there is likely battle armor hiding in those buildings. As mechs have a difficult time entering buildings, and there is a chance that they will be damaged. Oh, and I should uh, throw this up, Mega Mech. For anyone interested in what this is, what is currently happening. Okay, so why don't we move the pattern forward. And hopefully we will be able to, at the very least, get some more data. Or at least use it as bait. Okay, so the pattern has moved forward. I will probably move the gallow glass forward. That way we may actually engage the enemy. Okay, here we go. Hmm, I do not know what this sensor return is, and I'm very concerned that it hasn't moved yet. Let's see, where is my sprint scout helicopter? I think I want to make sure I know what this particular location is, or what this particular return is. So what I will do is move here. Uh, da, da, da. I will move past that. And I will come back. I have, to, I have to do it a little bit differently. There we go. And hopefully I'll be able to see what the enemy is. And I failed my skid. And I will... I probably won't be actually be able to see the enemy because of that. Oh, it was a scorpion. 
And a scorpion is very little threat. Although it is enough of a threat that I would make sure to destroy it. Now, I wonder where this enemy will move. They have a jumper in the fire starter. Too big to fit. Indeed. Uh, greetings, Kimmy Spice. Welcome to the convoy. We're currently currently doing something a little bit uh, a little bit odd, but uh, that's that's Mega Mech for you. We are playing with stompy robots on a hex grid. Right. And eventually we will do this with VTuber battle mechs. Oh, I guess I should uh, I should shill that. So in essence, I am create I, I am creating battle mechs inspired after the designs of uh, VTubers. And eventually, they will be fighting each other in a tournament. Well, not a tournament, but just a, a combat. And so far, we I believe we have a full lance of mechs. But that will need to grow. And I will probably this Saturday be doing another art session for that. Right, so we're, we're, gonna have to, we're going to have to move something. And that may have to be... The King Crab has to move forward. So we're going to move it forward. There we go, and we'll see where the enemy moves their Thunderbolt. Ooh, this is getting very bad. The enemy has a lot of mechs in position, whereas we don't. And their blasted scout helicopter is a lot better than mine. So I will move the Bushwhacker to intercept the Thunderbolt. And this might not go as well as I would have liked it to. The main advantage I have right now is that I am much better at my- Oh, no, no, no! The Thunderbolt jumped behind the King Crab. Damn it. I have failed dramatically. Verdammt! Okay. Ooh. Okay. Well, our sprints are only good for one thing now because the scouting phase is essentially over. So let's attempt to harass the enemy. Uh, there we go. One, two, three. And they... they might be blocked. They might be blocked with... no, they won't be blocked with Planet Fire. Alright. So let's maneuver our... our Gothas. So, what we need to do is we need to... We need to accelerate the fighter craft and we need to go up. And hopefully we'll be able to turn. Yes, we will be able to turn. Hopefully we will make it. Because if we can't turn fast enough, we are doomed. And there we go. Okay, perfect. We will be able to make it. And w Oh, this unit has not used all of its velocity. Unfortunate. There we go. There we go. And then the other Gotha will do the exact same flight path. One of the most annoying things about having a... So, one of the design conceits of Mega Mech is that due to the limitations in the engine... Aircraft are allowed to leave the board and come back, but that is very annoying and very difficult to use, so I try to make them fly rather slow so they can actually swing around and destroy it. Krabby too Krabby keeps you from su succeeding. Uh, yes, I, because of this quirk, I am essentially do I have doomed myself to some extent. My heaviest mech is very difficult to use. so. Full disclosure, I may lose this battle because I've been rolling very poorly on initiative and I've been making some pretty terrible moves. Okay. So the Raven once again is bothering me with tag. I'm just going to ignore it. Okay. What can we hit with the King Crab? You know what? We can hit something. We'll hit the Scorpion. Actually, no, no. We will hit the SRM Carrier because it is much scarier. And we will use standard auto cannon 5 munitions because we need to destroy it. Can we even. Can we swing it? Flip arms! Can we attack it? Ah, uh, no! That's the problem. Even if you flip the arms, which some mechs can do, uh, the fact that the LBX 20s are mounted in, in both the torso and the arm during the construction of the mech means that you cannot actually. Uh, flip the arm. The weapon won't flip. So, we have no choice but to attack what's in front of us. We're going to attack the SRM carrier because it is a lot scarier. So we're going to use standard munitions on that and fire. And standard munitions on that. 
And we're going to use the ER large laser and overheat a little bit. Actually, we're going to dial it down. So this is an advanced rule that lets you reduce the damage of energy weapons in exchange for less heat. So that is what I'm going to do in order to not overheat here. In fact, I need to dial it down to 10 heat. And that should be good. Yes, that should be good. So crab is fired. Now the gallo glass is going to turn around and attempt to give a solid knock. Oh damn, I can't I can't maneuver my Gauss rifle around. Stop, stop, stop. There we go. It's not worth it. I will use my Gauss rifle on the um on this on the medium tank here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna alpha strike it. Let's see here. Attacking the scorpion in the hopes of disabling it. It's a small tank. It's a small tank, but it's worth destroying it regardless. There we go. Attack and attack. And eight heat. We have to dial it down to that, and we won't overheat. And the bushwhacker can't attack anything except for the fire starter, who is very difficult to hit. So he's almost at minimum range. Let me see what SRM ammo will do for that. SRM ammo is actually worse chances to hit, so we will shoot the fire starter with both of our MML fives. We will shoot it with our ER large laser. And we will use the... No, no. We're actually going to use the plasma rifle instead because it's a much better weapon. Plasma rifle has a chance of overheating the enemy. And we will use our medium laser for three heat. Yes, we will. And we will use our other medium laser dialed down to two heat. There we go. Hopefully we'll damage the fire starter. And the raven has no targets. There we go. So we're done with that. Okay, Patton. Patton is going to turn its turret around and target the and target the Thunderbolt because it is a serious threat. And we're going to go to Ultra Mode and attack the Thunderbolt with our medium lasers and our Ultra AC-10. And we can't attack anything else with our for forward weapons. And fortunately, we can't attack the Thunderbolt, so we will attack the Scorpion with our Sprint Scout. And this Sprint Scout helicopter also can't attack anything. Okay. And the Gothas can't attack any enemies. Because they did not have a line of flight over the enemy. Okay, there we go. There we go. Done with that. Alright. Let's see here. Dropship won't do anything. Fantastic. Now, the... The infantry, the elementals that we have in the building, are just in range to attack with their small pulse, small micro lasers, the fire starter. So we're going to do that. And we do have short range missiles that we could use, but we're going to save them for a better time. And how far can our auto rifle reach? Not far enough, unfortunately. All right, let's take a look. So the King Crab uses his autocannon 20 to shred the front armor of the SRM carrier, and it kills it. So that is a combat kill, and that is what we wanted. Even though we only got one hit on it, that one hit was enough to destroy that particular vehicle. Kestrel shoots an SRM-2 and only one missile hits, and it was shooting at the fortress. How silly of it. Uh, the Gallo Glass destroys the Scorpion light tank by simply overwhelming it because it has very thin armor. So Gallo Glass has already done his job. The SRM carrier smacks our patent tank and really damages the motive system. So that means that our patent tank is unfortunately a lot slower now. Which is not too much of a problem in urban areas, but it is still a pain. So the Bushwhacker sh shoots only hits with a single MML-5 and only does one damage to the fire starter because there was an anti-missile system that engaged right here. Ah, TK, thank you for being with the convoy. I hope that you get some good rest. All right. So the scorpion. Uh, the scorpion took some shots at the king crab and it hit it with everything. And unfortunately... Oh, oh, it actually managed to hit a building. We had partial cover. So the patent tank... Wingmates, my luck is atrocious. The first time I fire the Ultra Auto Cannon 20 in Ultra Mode, it jams. Wonderful, wonderful.
But at least I hit the th oh, Thunderbolt with one of the medium lasers. My goodness me. Okay. The Atlas is shooting at the fortress. Wonderful. Thunderbolt is shooting at the King Crab. This is causing me a lot of trouble. Although my armor isn't currently breached. And the Centurion is also taking out his troubles on the fortress. Yes, I am in quite a jam, Attenborough. <laughs> you win some, you lose some. Luck in, luck in a nutshell, yes. But we will see how this turns around because the enemy's luck may very quickly turn around. Especially when I bring my King Crab to bear on any of these targets. And unfortunately, I can't kick any of them. In fact, I will be kicked myself. And he kicked, he missed. Wonderful. Okay, so this is an absolute mess. We are in deep trouble. Oh, and the dropship is looking worse for wear already. All right, so no artillery attacks, obviously. Let's see here. Once the bushwhacker moves away from the dropship, I think it will actually kick it off and try to get it off the field. So, speaking of getting it off the field, let's make sure that we're done with the movement of the fortress first. Okay. And we will have the, ra the Raven move next, because it is less important to my overall strategy. It is a sensors platform at this point. So we're going to move it into the city. There we go. We're going to move it behind the Atlas. There we go. So now... Hmm, okay, so the enemy is no longer hidden at all. The double blind effect is limited because we have so many sensors in the sky. However, once they once they go down, that will change rapidly. So oddly enough, I'm actually going to move my scout helicopters first because it really means a lot more that I move my mechs. So what I will do with my sprint is I will simply move it forth and I will move it back. Because I really don't care about the sprint helicopter. It does not have a lot of firepower. And I will move the second sprint. Excuse me, Windmates. I will also move the second sprint, which is here right now. I will move it right this way. Da 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 da. Move a little bit forward, move a little bit back. There we go. And hopefully that will keep feeding us data. Ooh, the enemy is moving their battle armor, which is a problem. And we have another sensor's return here. That might be another mech. Or actually, I'm not sure what it might be. I'm not sure. Yes, this could be. This could be a problem. So the enemy has not moved their thunderbolt. So what I will do is I will move the I will move the patent forward. Yes, because the patent is a sacrificial lamb at this point. We're simply going to move it into position and, and to make room for ourselves. Okay, and the Gallo Glass. Uh, the Gallo Glass, what it will do is it will move forward a bit, but at the same time it will turn sideways. So that way its rear armor is protected, and it will also be able to shoot uh, behind itself. There we go. Oh my goodness. This is a huge issue with this blasted and awful, awful uh, Thunderbolt. So let's move our King Crab in this position, and maybe we'll be able to knock out the Firestarter if he doesn't do anything. So the Thunderbolt, where did he go? The Thunderbolt jumped. So unfortunately, we may, may not be able to hit him, actually. And let's see, what is this move? Ah, oh, the Bushwhacker gets a move now. Actually, let's move the Elementals to the corner. There we go. So now the Elementals have made their move. And the Bushwhacker is up. So the Bushwhacker... Uh, we have no jump capability. So we're going to have to... Push through, I think. Push through into the trees. Yes, yes, we'll do that. We'll be protected by the trees, but at the same time, we'll also not be moving too far of the... Uh, we'll be covered by the King Crab. I see that the fire starter has jumped away and is now only a sensor's return. It knew that it was against a insurmountable foe. 
Hmm, let's see here. So my, honestly, my biggest threat here is the Thunderbolt. Okay. Let's see here. So let's use the Gotha. Let's use our air power to our advantage. So what we will want to do is hopefully attack the Thunderbolt. So I will accelerate twice, and I will fly over the Thunderbolt. Nope, I can't. Uh, simply due to the way I do not have enough flight speed. I can't turn fast enough to attack the Thunderbolt. Hmm. Let's try, let's try something a little different. Nope. Hmm, okay, so two accelerations. Okay, there it goes, there it goes. I think I misclicked. So we certainly can attack the Thunderbolt, which is what we will do. There we go. And we will sweep around the map. Okay. I need to get rid of the Thunderbolt because it is so maneuverable. So two more accelerations and another arcing move over the Thunderbolt. There we go. Fantastic. Whew. Oh, and the enemy fighters are in the area of operations. As you can see by the red line, the enemy fighter is back. But it appears it is likely going to focus on the dropship. Our poor, poor dropship. Oof. So, wingmates, uh, so far, what do you think of this chaotic nightmare of red tint and other such things? Because I, I think this is this is getting to be quite an intense city battle, even if there may be no sound effects or other action. Okay, no tag. Oh, good, good, good. Uh, no target for our King Crab other than the aircraft. We're going to switch back to Cluster Ammo. So there we go. We're shooting Cluster Ammo at the enemy aircraft. And we're going to switch to a different uh, volley of Cluster Ammo to attack the other aircraft. And there we go. And we'll shoot our... So we have 13, so we can go up to 11 heat. Hmm... Seven to hit, that is acceptable. We'll shoot our ER large laser at the enemy aircraft. Hopefully doing it some serious damage. And that is done with the King Crab. Our Gallo Glass will turn and at using sideways partial cover. So, uh, wingmates, this is the situation where I was talking about partial cover special rules. Uh, if you look here, you can see that the line of sight between the Gallo Glass and the Thunderbolt passes exactly along the hex spine hex line of this building hex. And this building hex is a height 3 medium building. So this basically means half of the mech is exposed, but it is around the corner. So it's a little bit harder to hit. Oh, I'm glad I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying this wingmates. As you can see, it is a lot harder to hit, and if I attack uh, certain parts on the mech, this shot will be considered to have hit the the building itself. But I would really like to damage the Thunderbolt. So what we will do is make sure that our Gauss Rifle is the first to shoot. Fortunately, the chances to hit are very low. And we will fire our Medium Pulse Laser. And Pulse Lasers have the highest chance to hit. And now we will fire our Large Lasers and try not to overheat. There we go. So the Bushwhacker cannot target anything, but it can target the aircraft. So that... Oh, can we target this VTOL? It is pointless to target the VTOL. So what we will instead do is we will go back down to bird's eye view. We will rotate our torso and we will target the aircraft. So we will use our long range missiles to have optimal distance. We may use the plasma rifle because it has a chance of overheating an aircraft. And overheating a craft means that it takes significant damage. Or it has a chance of uh, essentially basically falling down. Let's see here. Five damage, and we'll have to dial that down to four damage. Okay, there we go. So we have enough. We, uh, we neutralize our heat by utilizing the, uh, the dialing down technique. I know that not everyone enjoys the dial down house rule because it makes energy weapons a less a less uh, heat a, a proposition that is less dangerous for heat but I think it adds to the realism of the game and it prevents me from having nearly as much um, uh, sus 
broken suspension of disbelief when you can dial down the power of something like a laser because you simply emit less energy and you dial it down and that makes sense for many situations so the bushwhacker is done and the raven actually has a target and we will attack these infantry we'll fire off all of our medium lasers and our mml5 and we'll be using srms on these infantry which are short range missiles which do more damage than long range but uh Oh, this is a problem. We need to unjam this this weapon. Uh, let's see here. Special. Weapons, skip, modes, ultra, twist. Okay, so we need to move special. Oh, I think I can't move at all to clear my turret. Because it would be clear weapon jam, but I, actually, I moved. So I can't clear the weapon jam. So what I will instead do is use my machine guns to shred the battle armor as best I can. In addition to using the medium lasers on the turret. And I can't even attack the Thunderbolt that's behind me. Actually, no, 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 no. The, the Thunderbolt is much more valuable. So I will turn the turret and use my medium lasers to attack it as my primary target. And then I will use the machine guns to attack the battle armor. There we go. Kind of like a lower setting on a flashlight. Indeed, indeed. At Burrow. That is exactly what uh, powering down or reducing the power of energy weapons is like. That definitely makes sense from an immersion perspective. Yes, this game already breaks enough immersion. One second, wingmates. I require some hydration. Ah, fantastic. My life support system should uh, handle that for me. Let's see here. Let's, we're done here. So, wingmates, I don't think I'm going to go for... I do not know if I will be able to finish this game, uh, but you can save them. So that is, I think, what I will do. The The issue is I don't want to be up supremely late. <laughs> I, I do have... Uh, I, I do wish to hibernate at a, at a reasonable duration at some point. Let's see, so we have no targets that we can hit with that Sprint Scout helicopter. And this Sprint Scout helicopter can hit the Thunderbolt, but it's at a 14 plus to hit. So that will not work. Okay, and the Gothas will be now be attacking the Thunderbolt. So that we'll be using Pulse Lasers and Medium Lasers, our Wing Lasers. Uh, nope. And we will skip that, and we will use our Small Lasers. Okay, this is a bit of a desperate shot. It's a very hard shot. But any damage I do to the Thunderbolt is good damage done to the Thunderbolt. So I'm hoping that at least something of this will hit. There we go. Okay. And what else do we have? And we have the, the Elementals, I believe. Oh. For, no, the Fortress. The Fortress. And now the Elementals, which have no shots that they can make, unfortunately. We will have to jump with the Elementals and move from the building. Okay, here we go. So, what happened this turn? So the King Crab managed to hit with one of the LBX-20s in cluster mode, and it did hit the Chippewa, uh, Chippewa, and it missed with the second LBX-20. And it did actually hit with the large laser, and it hit the rear, and I almost had a critical on the Chippewa. And the Chippewa hits the fortress once again, so I kind of don't care. And the Gallo Glass also goes for the Thunderbolt, but misses everything. The Kestrel misses, the Bushwhacker manages to land. Ah, and we actually crit the large laser on one of the Chippewas. And we also do ding it a little bit more. And the Raven manages to injure the troopers and take down a lot of their armor. Okay, that is good, that is good. So the Patent Tank misses everything. And the Atlas actually damages our fortress again. My goodness, they are wasting ammo on that poor, poor dropship. So the Gothas miss, and one of the Gothas doesn't miss, actually. It lands a Pulse Laser hit on the Thunderbolt, and we almost get a critical on the Thunderbolt, but we are chipping away at the armor. So hopefully when we finally get a good shot on that blasted Thunderbolt, we will, we will be much better off. And, this, and the Gallo Glass hits us in the center torso. Or the Thunderbolt hits the Gallo Glass in the center torso. 
Now we can kick with the crab, but I'm not going to kick. We have no reason to. Neither does the gallow glass. But our Patton will be kicked. Because the Thunderbolt has no reason not to kick it. And we will not kick the building with the Raven either. Okay. And the Chippewa does not fall. Because the pilot is good enough. Perfect, perfect. Well, not perfect for me. So there's a lot of fire on the field right now. A lot of fire. So, no more artillery. We don't care. Okay. So where's Princess going to go? Let me check the round report. Uh, so I actually won initiative this time. So the last move should be mine. As long as I do things correctly. So what we will do is we will actually... Make sure we move the dropship first by not moving it. Oh, and wingmates, uh, aircraft always move last to represent the fact that they have the ability to line up a shot on the enemy. So now we will move our sprints because I, again, I don't care. They can do whatever they want. They're just here to play around with us. But I will move them closer to where the enemy may actually be. Yes. Yes, I think I will do that. I'll, I'll just uh, maneuver the helicopters more to the position of where the enemy mechs are. So there we go. And we're skidding all over the place, of course. So now that we've skid, we can actually make our way this way. Oh, we skidded again. Well, we'll keep moving even if we skidded. And we discovered where the enemy fire starter was. We'll just keep moving so that we get more movement modifier. Hmm. Okay, okay. So, the enemy helicopter pulled away. Now we'll move our second helicopter so that we can move the crab last. I really, really, really want the crab in order to get an actual hit off on the enemy. That would make my day. Okay, there we go. And let's pull back a little bit there and actually rotate instead of going that far forward. Nope, one more back. One more back, and we rotate. There we go. Moving along. Okay, so the helicopter has moved. This pattern is, at this point, garbage, so let's... Let's attempt to unjam the main gun. Let's see here, so options, let's see here, move, physicals, self-destruct, special, uh, da, 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 movement, backup, turn, about face, physicals, charge. I think I will have to not move and then I can do unjam. Yes, I, th I think I'll have to wait. I'll have to wait a little bit. So the main, the main idea is that I don't move with the patent tank. Okay, and what units do we have left? So let's move the Raven. The Raven is currently in the thick of it, so we may actually want to hide it a little bit. Although it is acting as our rear rear scout and revealing a lot of these a lot of these enemy positions. Hmm. The last thing we want to do is move it near the Atlas. Because that is a death sentence. So in fact, I think we will just maneuver it here and hide behind the building. This may be a bit of a problem. Okay, so it's mostly fighting battle armor. So let's make sure we move these elementals before we move anyone else. So we're going to have them jump out of the building. And only element, only battle armor is able to jump out of the windows of a building. So keep that in mind. Uh, Proto-mechs can't jump out of a building and mechs can't do it either if they have entered a building. Although for mechs, that is a very painful proposition unless you are a good pilot. It takes a lot of skill to ram a battle mech into an office building and have it come out unscathed. So what instead we are doing is we are jumping into the fray here with our with our infantry. So what is left? The gallo glass is left to maneuver. And I think I do not like this particular path of engagement, but at least our, our Patton is here. So what I will do is I will actually 
So one of the interesting things is there's a there's a thing called stacking rules in Battletech. And that means that you cannot have uh, different kinds of units on top of one another, with certain exceptions. So two mechs cannot stack in the same hex, but a vehicle and a mech, or two vehicles, can stack in the same hex. And infantry also uh, can stack in the same hex. So there's there's a bunch of rules for that. So let's move the gallo glass forward, I suppose, and see what happens. That blasted thunderbolt is still not moved. I have to have the last move because I won initiative. So I will move. I will move the bushwhacker. Uh, let's see what's going on with the bushwhacker. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. We're gonna have to risk some piloting skill checks here for the bushwhacker because I need him to get into the field and to also not be killed by the enemy. We do not want to split our fire at all. There is a Centurion here, although the line of sight to the Centurion will be limited. Ah, uh, my goodness. Okay, we'll do this. Hopefully we'll be okay. And we passed our piloting skill check. That We got lucky there. That could have been a flip into the basement if we were not careful. If we skidded, rammed into a building, and went into the basement. So the Thunderbolt did not move. So I'm going to kill it if I can. I'm going to risk a lot with my King Crab in order to engage in this level of violence. All right, let's see if we can do it. And of course, the enemy aerospace is attacking my, my King Crab. So let's see what we can do with our aerospace. Okay, so we need to go, we need to accelerate, we need to go up. And at this point, we just need to burn off. No, we already have velocity. We have velocity one, so all we need to do is go up. So let's burn off some speed. And hopefully, we will be able to do this properly. Oof, oh, this is becoming a problem. Okay, so... Go up, and just rotate, oh, no, no. Oh, I see, we could do that, we could do that. Yeah, I think that would actually be better. So we go up, and we head this way, and we turn. Okay, I think that will be acceptable. There we go, so let's move. The unit has not used all of its velocity, what are you talking about? Of course I have. Oh, I see. Then we have to turn, no matter what, or else we're going to go off the map. Although, no, no, we should turn. Okay. And then the the second Gotha will do the exact same thing. That is the nice thing about stacking aircraft, is they can end up doing the exact same thing each time. And the Chippewa left the map. Okay. Simply because it was way too fast. All right, let's take a look what our situation here is. No indirect attacks. There we go. All right, so the King Crab will shoot the Thunderbolt in slug mode. Because we want to bash holes in its armor. And I think... Will I fire Shrieks or will I fire my large laser? I think I'll shoot my ER large laser at the... At the, uh, at the mech. Maybe it's a bit off topic, but the line of sight talk is reminding me of this one Dugram tabletop game where you would put a periscope on a unit's location to see what it could hit. Oh, that is very interesting. I like those sorts of mechanics. Um, in, in Battletech, if you play using miniatures rules with terrain, you actually are advised to go down to the mech's level with your head and take a look to see what it, what it, what the mech could possibly see at that distance. So I think it's um I think it's a fairly fairly cool uh, cool thing when you have actual physicality to help you with these rules. So we'll do the large laser with one less heat. We'll dial it down to six, so we have ten heat, and that will put us perfectly heat neutral. And we will not fire the rest of our racks here. 
Although, we can actually afford to have three spare heat, and a streak SRM4 gives us exactly three spare heat. So let's fire both, because it is unlikely both will hit. We're, we're banking on probability here, wingmates. So, let's see if we can unjam that turret. Although, I think that is quite frankly... Oh no, this is the Gallo Glass. So the Gallo Glass will need to rotate and do its best to kick the uh, kick the snot out of the Thunderbolt. So we're firing our Gauss Rifle, we're firing our Medium Pulse Laser, and we'll fire our Large Laser, and to not overheat, we will actually... We'll dial it back up to 8, because we can afford to overheat now. This this We need more damage than we need overheating. So the Bushwhacker is not in an optimal position, but it's in an optimal position to attack the Scorpion. So we will fire our MMLs, and we will fire our Plasma Rifle at the Scorpion. And now we will also engage our ER, ER Large Laser... Although, we have a problem. Too much heat, so we'll have to use our medium lasers instead. Okay, and we'll fire that, and we will fire... No, we'll, we need to dial it back a little bit there. Dial it down to four damage, and fire. Okay. Perfectly heat bounced. Let's see, what do we have? So this is our Raven. And it is currently facing the fire starter. So it will rotate its torso and it will target the fire starter. And we're going to do a burst of medium laser fire and a SRM MML7 shot. There we go. Alright, so now let's see if we can unjam unjam this weapon. Well, for whatever reason I cannot unjam it, so we're just going to have to shoot. Let's see, special, physical, aerospace, unjam. We're just going to shoot at the Thunderbolt using our medium lasers. There they are, shooting medium lasers, and the machine guns can attack that. Oh, and the Centurions moved in. Damn it. This is becoming a very troublesome situation. We'll shoot the medium laser at the Thunderbolt, and this one can shoot at the Scorpion. The Sprint Scout helicopter, that is. I do have a picture sh that shows what it looks like. Oh, please, please, Attenborough. That, that is very fascinating and potentially inspirational. So please feel free to show what the uh, the Dugram tabletop periscope looks like. So now we have the the Gothas doing their shots. And the Gothas have actually ended up with a lucky fire starter hit. Uh, so, wingmates, th this is why... This is why sometimes things are unpredictable. The fire starter actually jumped and is currently on a building uh, that is uh, right in the flight path of of our fighters. So we will actually have an opportunity to, to attempt to destroy the fire starter. Thank you. Let's take a look at this. Oh wow, that is really neat. Yes, I, I see the issue with a uh, very small terrain. It's very difficult to get a floor level perspective. Hmm. Attenborough, I, I am inspired enough that I would like to do some crafts within my simulation. In fact, I may make make a... Let me write this down. Make mm -mm. make small periscope for seeing uh, seeing perspective on tabletop. Yes, that will be very fascinating. And allow me to link that image to myself. I need to put that in the notes. Yes, yes. Very inspirational. Very inspirational. I'm, I'm liking this. Okay. All right. Let's let's return to Mega Mech. I think after this round of shooting, we can actually. There we go. Fire starter. And, we'll, of course, we'll just keep shooting with everything we have again. While trying not to overheat. There we go. Done, and hopefully we will be able to at least cripple the fire starter. So this battle is far from over, but it is starting to become more apparent that the enemy does not know how to use their airborne assets. Then again, Princess is not well trained with aerospace. Alright, let's see here. So we have attacked with everything that's reasonable, so we're done with that. 
And the dropship will, of course, not attack. And the elementals will now attack the Thunderbolt and fire off their SRMs. And use our auto rifles. So we're doing all that we can to damage the Thunderbolt. Alright, so let's see what the round report looks like. So the enemy aerospace fighter, their Chippewa, uh, attacked our King Crab and it did some damage to the legs and to the right torso. This is not good, but our armor is holding. And luckily it hit us with scattershot weapons primarily. Only the SRM-6s and the LRM-15s connected, whereas the direct weapons missed. So the King Crab manages to hit with both both of the auto cannon 20s, but it hits the blasted building. So we destroy the building section and we miss with the laser and we we manage to hit the building again using partial cover because technically the building doesn't cease to exist until the, the until the phase of the term is over. Yes, Princess's combined arms reps are not very good. But she, Princess tries. Let's see here. So the Kestrel missed. And the Gallo Glass actually manages to do a very significant bit of damage to the Thunderbolt. So, first the Gauss Rifle impacts and hits the right arm, stripping away the armor and only leaving four internal structure left. The Medium Pulse Laser hits the right leg. Another large laser rips into the right arm, destroying it. And we even managed to transfer criticals, disabling the targeting computer. Oh no, it lost the targeting computer. So now the Thunderbolt should be having a much harder time hitting. And the other laser hits the left torso, stripping out the armor on the Thunderbolt. So the Thunderbolt is actually starting to take serious damage. I need to see what weapons it lost. So the Bushwhacker immobilizes the Scorpion with a very lucky single missile hit. <laughs> Look at this. This, this, is, this, is, this is the worst part about Battletech. I, I cannot stand that vehicles just fall apart so quickly. It is, it is absolutely insane that tracks get disabled so quickly, but the blasted knee joints of a complicated... complicated bipedal frame somehow don't jam when a weapon... when a laser starts sweeping energy across the blasted joint. That gets me heated, wingmates. That is absolute garbage. Of course, I am a bit of a treadhead, so... Uh... Legs are a very vulnerable motive system once they are hit. I suppose tracks are wider in surface area, but goodness me. Ugh. You have dozens of tons of armor that you can have to stand on legs, but you can't put the same kind of armor quality armor or a sim tr simple tracked vehicle. Well, Alaric, if you look at some of the heavier tracked vehicles, they have enormous quantities of armor. And some of them, even in the art, you can't even see the treads because they are covered in armor. And yet... <laughs> and and the, that is almost the same thing that happens with the, with the mechs, is that their joints are covered in armor. Ugh, man. Yeah. No, I, I definitely agree that it's it's it, it is reasonable to assume that a track, which is a which is a single point of failure, if you rip it apart, that is a vulnerable point. But that, if you think about that, then wouldn't wheels be more durable than tracks in that sense? But at, at that point, this becomes a very difficult discussion. But uh, I, I understand your point, Alaric. I am I am I am only full of vitriol right now. Because ma because I see vehicles being hurt too much. I know the designs would probably filter you, but you should try getting into heavy gear. It's balanced much more towards tanks. Well, heavy gear actually does appeal to me somewhat, but uh, that would be interesting to look into to see how the rules don't de debuff tanks. Let's see. So the Raven actually manages to destroy a double heat sink on the fire starter. So that is very good news. So we are chipping away at the fire starter. And the fire starter manages to almost get a crit on the Raven, but the Raven is taking damage. So the Patton actually manages to damage more of the Thunderbolt. Let's see. The Atlas keeps attacking the Fortress. The Sprint misses. The Thunderbolt hits the Gallo Glass and strips away a bunch of armor. 
And the Gothas... Ooh, the Gothas managed to actually destroy the left arm on the, on the Firestarter. And they managed to also destroy the left torso. So that Firestarter is not looking good. And let's see, so the, the Elemental Battle Armor actually manages to land its hits on with the lasers and with the SRMs. And we managed to strip away even more armor. And even the machine gun on the uh, on the bat on the battle armor hits the thunderbolt. So the debris collapse, unfortunately, hurts our our battle armor troopers. But luckily, their armor protects them enough that they don't die. Uh, the yellow glass falls. The crab is standing, and the thunderbolt manages to stand. That is very annoying. Okay, so we we now have a fallen mech. This very much sounds like Mech Warrior Online. Well, it is, it is Battletech, and of course, the things that are happening are very much similar. Alright, we can't kick the Thunderbolt, unfortunately, and I have very little reason to kick here. That fire starter is not doing good. Okay, perfect. So the Thunderbolt actually kicks the Gallo Glass and hits me in the engine! Oh, that's really bad. That means I will be generating more heat. That is very bad. Okay. So, assessing our situation, we can actually have the fortress take off. Uh, because... Uh, because it, we, we have no need for the dropship. Although that will, of course, mean that the enemy will begin targeting us and not the dropship. But that's okay, so let's actually do that before we forget. So, no, no targets. Okay, yeah. oh, I mean, this game is all about not having nice things. So let's go to it, and before we save the game, let's do a vertical lift off. And we will automatically lift off. So, so we will soon be able to get rid of the fortress and have it leave the map and no longer bother us. Now this... This game could go anyone's way. Depending on luck, this could either be a victory for our side or for the enemy. Okay, let's take a look at the Thunderbolt right now. So we'll view the Thunderbolt. So if we look at the armor, the Thunderbolt has a stripped left torso, which has taken a significant pounding. It's running a little hot and it's missing its right arm. And the legs are not heavily damaged. So in terms of remaining weapons, that l that right arm being missing actually took out one of its most powerful weapons, the snub nose PPC. So it is significantly reduced in how much how in its threat level. Uh, the scorpion is immobile, so it's far easier to kill, and will likely be a last focus of ours. And let's take a look at the fire starter because that's another one that we damaged. Let's see. So view fire starter. So the fire starter is looking very bad. It only has five center structure. So a single medium laser hit here, or actually to the left arm or the left torso will kill it. So the fire starter can, could even be killed by the raven at this point, uh, short of a, unlucky hits. So the, the fire starter is at this point crippled, very much crippled. And it's missing the vast majority of its weapons except for its flamers. So it is not as much of a battlefield threat. Let's see, our Gallo Glass. Let's take a look at our Gallo Glass. So our Gallo Glass has all of its weapons, but the pilot took a hit, which means that he has a greater chance of being unconscious. And unfortunately, we took a hit through our rear armor, which was weakened. And we now have internal left torso damage, which is unfortunately also a critical hit to our engine, which is very bad, because now we will be running hotter. We'll have to deal with it somehow. As you can see, we're at 7 heat already, which is a problem. And the Patton is still still in a bad state. And this is what the armor diagrams for vehicles look like, wingmates. They have uh, armor around the perimeter rather than in locations. And that way, you can sort of rotate vehicles and have them take damage at different portions of their armor as they turn in different directions. Let's take a look at our elementals. Oops. Uh, it's... Can we view the elementals? Yes, we can. So one of the elementals is very hurt, 
but the others are only about halfway damaged. So overall, our forces are doing okay, but this could still really go anyone's way because urban environments are oftentimes about timing and about luck. And right now, we are going to need all of that. So the enemy still has a fully intact Centurion. They still have a fully intact Atlas. Hmm. Yeah, we have not done very good e exchange on this. We will basically be relying on our Gothas to deal damage to enemy mechs. So let's make sure that we save the game. So file, game, save locally. And we will... Let's see, so it's in save games, and we'll call it, uh, let's see, 2021, 2021-04-15. Uh, there we go. And that's our save game name. All right. Game has been saved. Now let's take a look. That's game. We can't load one. We can only load from that lobby. Okay. So, let me turn off the capture here. Alright. And I will close the game later. There we go. And we can move back to the space station. And I will power down the music. Ah. All right, well, wingmates, I know that was a bit of a, of a slower session than usual, but I was also in the mood for something a little less intense than perhaps uh, Free Space or even Sins of Solar Empire. But uh, it's one of those weeks. After, after the excitement of Yuri's Night, I did want to have a little bit of a more low-key energy. But I do hope that it was enjoyable viewing it while, while you were here. Ah. Okay. Well, <laughs> hello, Warhammer Dad. I didn't, I didn't see you. Uh, oh, my goodness, I saw you a bit late. I'm sorry, Warhammer Dad. <laughs> oh, wonderful, wonderful. I'm glad that a bit of a, a bit of classic tabletop action was of interest. Ah, all right. So, uh, I suppose just, uh, yes, I, I will be doing a proper lecture on on Mega Mech mechanics. I'll be going down to the very nitty gritty of how Battletech actually works, because right now I've been hopping around and just say, saying things like, oh, that's an, that's an easy to hit. Oh, that's in range. But what does that actually mean? What? How do the numbers that is, are associated with each mech, how do they translate into the actual actions that you can do on the battlefield? <laughs> Makes me want to play Warhammer, but that is dangerous currently. Ah, Warhammer Dad, have you considered using something like Vassal? Or some kind of, uh, um, custom, uh, what's the word? Custom tabletop simulator module? There are options, I suppose, online, but, uh, they are limited, uh, to, to some extent. That is one of the unfortunate things about online play. Let's see here. Let me see who we have in our IFF transponder for a potential raid. Let's see, oh, quite a few, fo quite a few folks. So we have Bunzel, we have Rocco, we have Thinker Bella. Hmm. Okay. I have not raided Bunzel in a while. I think that may may be an interesting raid. Although I think I should raid Rocco potentially, because Rocco has raided me before quite a few times. So I think I should return it. Yes, paper bag is also on. Bunzel is doing retro fishing, I believe. Let's take a look here. I guess I will leave it up to to wingmates uh, to see what they would like to uh, be a raid. So right now, Bunzel is doing some retro arcade fishing. I believe on the Atari Twenty Six Hundred. Let's see. Paper bag is doing. What is paper bag doing? Let's see. Oh. Paper bag is doing Remu bag. So I think he's doing a lecture on Tuhu. How to draw it with Zoon. And Rocco is also doing some art. Hmm. Paper bag seems interesting. I, I've not seen him do uh, art for Tuhu before. 
And Rocco is doing some pixel art, doing uh, Eripai, our, our alien friend. Uh, wingmates, what, what would you like to see? So we have some vintage Atari 2600 fishing. We have some some art from Tuhu and apparently a karaoke later. And we also have pixel art of our resident alien VTuber, Eripai. Or Aripi, I can never figure out the pronunciation and I still have forgotten to ask. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, I need to, I need to correct that immediately. Oh my goodness. Well, uh, wingmates, if you have any opinions, please let me know. Otherwise, I may end up rolling a die, but I am leaning towards paper bag because uh, that is very unusual. Uh, some some Tuhu art. Hmm. A blast from the pa uh, from uh, past from Bunzel sounds nice too. Yes, yes, indeed. Now uh, let's see. Can I throw together a quick poll? Oh, polls are fun. Let's see here. How quickly can I throw together a poll? Raid. We raid. Bunzel. Let's see. Bunzel. Da 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 da. Mm hmm. Rocco. And we have. Paper bag. And then. Options. Live discussion. Different color. Allow user added answers. Publicly list. Now. Go create poll. Okay. Always with a scuff. Always with the scuff. There you go. There's a poll for uh, <laughs> for any voting that you would like to do. Okay. Well, in the meantime, um, allow me to shill Project Avatar. Uh, let's see. There we go. Av uh, Avatar. So for any, so I'm creating battle mechs to to play in this particular game in Mega Mech. That will be modeled after the capabilities and mod and the actual art of VTubers. And there's also a viewer submission play, uh, viewer submission post. So if anyone would like to attend that or be a part of it, please feel free to uh, make a comment there or DM me either on Twitch or on on uh, Twitter if you are a little bit shy. And I will, I suppose, anonymize those particular results. Uh, let's see here. Uh, this Friday, I will also likely be doing a stream. I apologize for the lack of schedule, but uh, it's it's been it's been a strange while. <laughs> but uh, hopefully on Friday. Oh, Friday there's a collaboration with uh, with uh, Miwa et al. There will be a there will be a reading of Hatful Boyfriend. This time we will be doing the other routes. Let me find a link for that very quickly so I can also plug that. Let's see here. Where is Miwa's Twitter? Uh, da, 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 da. I need to see that post. Mm-hmm. Miwa, there we go. Ah, there it is. There it is. Okay. But yes, we will be we will be playing or reading Hatful Boyfriend. And there is a potential that I will also do another another reading. Or another um another stream later that night. It really depends on uh, the situation after that. As I cannot spend all time uh, streaming, unfortunately, I do have to do maintenance and other things with the wishful thinking and also take care of my own self. Despite, uh, despite me being in a virtual simulation, I still have to engage in hibernation after all. Ah, I see, I see. Ah yes, uh, Warhammer Dad, you're you're going to be doing some Stellaris with the new with the new DLC and patch. That is nice. Well, anyone who is interested in that, please feel free to join War uh, Warhammer Dad with Stellaris. Although uh, I think it, the collaboration will start at 3 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, but uh, it it is it is what it is. <laughs> the collaboration is also with multiple people, so it's not uh, it's not as if that uh, will intrude in any way. Okay, wingmates. Well, so the voting appears to be in favor of rating Paper Bag. So I think we will do exactly that. Paper Bag channel will be rated shortly. Oh, I'm looking forward to seeing his uh, his Remu his Remu Paper Bag. All right, wingmates. Let's get prepared for a raid. Let's be polite. Let's be courteous. Let's see here. Raid Paper Bag. There we are. 
Ah, oh, for sure, 4.30. That's a, that's a good start time. I will not be able to see that, paper, uh, uh, Warhammer Dad, because I will be in the middle of reading lines. But uh, to anyone else who wishes to, to see that, please feel free to join that, ch that particular playthrough. All right, all right. All right, wingmates, uh, let me get you the raid message. Uh, feel free to modify it as you see fit. Thank you all for attending this uh, particular uh, gaming session. I know it was fairly low-key, but that's how it goes sometimes. Here it is. There you are. Uh, thank you all for being here. I hope that you keep your propellant tanks topped off and your jump calculations. Uh, make sure that they are quite accurate. And as always, fly safe. All right, wingmates, it's been a, it's been a pleasant and uh, low-key evening, and I hope that your evening or your uh, your time continu continues to be nice. So I will see you at the raid. Let's behave, everyone. <laughs> All right, initiating in five, four, three, two, one, raid. <laughs>